We'll be joining our friend Ka Brian Karen in a minute, in one minute. Let me know if you are here with me. Yes, the man, the myth, the legend Brian Karen. Definitely, that's him. That's him, definitely. Guys, we are having the friend that is pretty much very, very respected and very much uh, expected. His name is Brian Karen. In a moment, you'll see why this... Uh, person is that much important in the chess community, especially US chess community, because we'll be talking about chess in a, let's say, various perspective and the title for today's stream, because this stream will be on the YouTube, uh, I'll be uploading this very, very soon. Chess is more than just a game. This is the general title for our meeting, and I guess it would be great if we just make it, let's say, as uh, interesting as possible, and at the same time, providing some of the information. Thank you very much, first of all, my friend, for being with us. I'm really honored that you accepted the invitation. And I'm just starting with the pretty much common question. How are you? Oh, okay. Well, how are you? I mean, thank you for having me. Um, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's. Um, I listened to some of your, pod to your um, podcasts. Uh, mm -hmm. Thomas Luther, I was just listening to. Very interesting. And, um, you know, I think you, you do a great job. And, and it's an honor to be on here. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your kind words. I'm really happy that we can, uh, let's say, bring the community together. And at the same time, we can just uh, make the community flourish because all of us in the group, especially because we are the members of the chess group that I am the, let's say, one of the person who is super happy to have such a great friends. I am asking some of the friends in our group to pop up into the interviews. Most of the time they accept the invitation and then just making the community a little bit more expanded especially as we have more new players that will be talking in a moment that they are popping up and they should know about the history about the servers about the rules about the ratings that will be continuing if you can start yeah, yeah to... i think you're feeling in a good need there showing uh a lot of the um kind of over, like we, we focus on the great players and which is natural and, and good but um the people who just really make the community move and you know, I mean, I'm honored that you consider me one of them, but just, you know, all the people out there, uh, chess, um, you know, it, what makes it a great game? Listen, you know, most people aren't going to meet Magnus Carlsen, you know, even if they do, it'll probably be brief, yeah. but, um, you know, a friendship with someone like you and me and the people at your local club, or you might meet someone online. Um, and then, uh, you know, and, and then the volunteers, obviously, who help in a lot of ways, like we do, um, it's just uh it's overlooked which uh, is understandable but it's nice that you're creating something to kind of celebrate that yeah yeah i guess it's a very important and as i just repeat all of the time that everybody in our community can can make the community better right no matter what kind yes. of ways we can do it one matter activities but if you are supporting i mean the content creators the podcasters the youtubers the streamers all of the people who are just bringing the community a little bit higher together we are making the chess paradise but before getting ah, to yeah. the chess paradise i will just ask you a little bit about introduction and a little bit uh, if you can get us into the chess world that you pop up how your chess journey has started what was the conditions that you start playing chess and so on if you just give us a little bit of uh, overview about yourself and how you get into the chess community okay all right that's a good question um well i i first learned the rules from my cousin um but didn't really take to it too much um you know it that then when i was around uh maybe 15 or so i visited england and we went to this huge department store i think it's harrods or i think what it's called like the biggest department store mm -hmm. and um they were selling an electronic chess set there and I just really wanted to get that chess set. I don't know why, you know, I wasn't into chess at that point. At first, my dad didn't want to get it for me, but, you know, I was just making a big deal about it. And um, so he did get it for me. And, uh, you know, this was the days, um, back then it was fun to play chess computers, you know, because mm -hmm. you had a chance, uh, you know, even a beginner like me, you know, at, at that time. Um, whereas now I, I don't enjoy it as much because you just know they're either going to kill you or they're purposely going to lose to you, you know? Um, but, uh, you know, I, I really had, it was a little peg set and I had my battles with it and, um, you know, it, it started out, you know, I couldn't beat it and slowly I could beat it on one level, then I'd move up. I mean, I'd imagine the program was at best, you know, 1600 strength or something. This was like in the, uh, you know, mid 1980s. And of course mm -hmm. I was starting out as a ranked beginner. Yeah. I remember I had this little opening formation I would play 
I'd move the two center pawns up and the F pawn up one and the C pawn up one. And I called it the bell formation. Oh. And it was like my opening. And, you know, I tried to beat the computer from it all the time. But then somewhere around then, uh, the local paper um, was advertising for someone to work at a chess shop. You know, there was amazingly where I lived was this place called Your Move Chess. And it was a computer chess store. Again, this was the mid 80s. So it was kind of a, you know, unique thing. And they they were well known all over the country. You know, they, they were doing a Steve, this guy, Steve Schwartz ran it. And uh, again, Your Move Chess. And they, they um, even though they had a storefront where people would come in and get sets, it was mainly mail order. And people mm -hmm. were calling all over the country. They were one of like two or three people who were selling chess sets at the time, um, you know, all over. Um, so I, I had this opportunity, I came in and, um, you know, uh, there I started to realize what the chess world was like. Again, I was just a high school kid, probably about 16 years old at this time. And I had a mentor, Bob Sastak. He was a tournament chess player there. Um, I think he was probably around 1800 strength, expert strength. Um, he didn't play in a lot of tournaments, so I don't know if his rating reflected it, but he was definitely somewhere around there. Um, and uh so he mentored me a lot and at the same time i'm getting like crazy calls from people like i i thought they were like insane you know oh you know i need to learn the sicilian major if you know I, I need to learn the nimzo indian like all these crazy things that they're so passionate about and again at that point i was still a semi chess outsider and it was just amazing to me that some that adults could be like so into this game and you know everything's about learning this and learning that and you know um but uh, I certainly, you know, met a lot of chess players there and I got to play the chess computers. Now, this is the other thing that's a little bit fun about this. Mm -hmm. I think I was one of the first computer chess kids. So nowadays, you know, a little kid enters a chess tournament and you really don't know his strength. He might have been playing online, you know, using the computer resources, everything. You know, all of a sudden he's way beyond his ability or what you would expect from a beginner. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, that everyone accepts that. Nowadays, when, when I was doing it, you know, I was playing the computer all the time. That was a rarity. So the day, um, so then one day uh, there was an online thing called the Link Network. I think mm -hmm. it was Link. This yeah. was one of the very first online. Remember, this is around 1985. Uh -huh. So most people don't even, aren't even aware of anything about online. It's really before the internet. You know, it's a, it's a special server that people would go on to play chess on. And I met a guy named Alan Cantor. He, he's a national master, he's a coach. Um, and we, we played some games and, and he talked to me. It was very nice. You know, he was of course a veteran chess player at that point. Um, and he told me that there's a chess tournament hall in Levittown, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a nearby town to where I was living. And um, you could go and you could play rated chess events. And again, I was still, you know, I knew now about the chess world from working at ICD. But I still um, didn't fully comprehend. And I was like a typical kid. I played video games, you know, I, you know, little, all the, the different stuff that, you know, teenagers do. Um, I remember I was into a game called Ultima and I was mm -hmm. like playing it a lot. And, and the Joust, there was a video game Joust that I played a lot, which most kids wouldn't have the faintest idea, you know, what they are that, now. Anyway, um, so he takes me to Levittown Hall, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice building. And uh, he opens up the door. And in the door, there's probably, I mean, maybe 80 people in the club. It was one of the bigger clubs on Long Island. Probably 20 of them are masters. I mean, this was like a very impressive club for the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just all there, you know, in separate seats, obviously, you know, like a chess tournament, playing, playing chess. And um, so that really, then it really hit me what this is all about, that this is like a real game you know that 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 has uh you know and it's adults i'm just a teenager and everyone's so serious about it and um that was a huge attraction and at that point you know video games were out it's like all right i knew how video games were and it's the same thing today i'll get really good at a video game and then two or three years later no one really is into that game and it's like well what did i accomplish you know um but now i saw here's a video well not a video game but a real game that, you know, there's such a culture to it and there's so many people playing, there's like real stakes, you know, mm -hmm. real adults really want to win and you gotta, you gotta play against them. So, um, you know, I think that day, you know, when Alan took me down to the club and showed me around, that was it. I was just hooked. Um, and then, uh, you know, I mean, I don't want to go on and on, um, but, uh, you know, basically, uh, you know, I continued playing. I had to go to college. That kind of affected me a little bit, you know, I couldn't play as much, but, uh, long story short, I, uh, 
I, I lived in a place, well, there is one funny thing. Um, so I couldn't get to play too much in college. I played a little bit, but not too much, particularly tournament rated. And then, um, and then I got a job in a, in a place called Massachusetts. And um, what was very funny is, you know, it was one that was like a social work job, but then I could go to the club afterwards, uh, you know, it meant on some day of the week. And normally I could just play rated games and, and my rating would move up because I was studying chess all the time. You know, mm -hmm. I really loved it. And, um, but what's funny is the guy who ran the club got into a fight with the state chess association. So he wouldn't do a rated tournament. So, and this, the only way he could get a rated tournament is I had to drive about an hour to some other club, a place called Springfield. You know, I would play there and then come back and take another hour drive, which combined with the long hours, you know, social work there, you know, yeah. very long hours of work with these emotionally disturbed kids. And um, so I really couldn't play much rated. So now here's the funny thing. So again, I was studying chess all the time. And looking back, it's very clear I was expert strength at that point. And we had another guy who was an expert there, um, but he was terrible. I, I mean, I don't want to say terrible, terrible, but he definitely was an expert strength. Like we would play blitz, I'd beat him all the time, you know, whatever it is. But his number was expert. And back then I was maybe 1800 rated, even though, and I wouldn't say it back then, but, you know, looking back, you know, I don't, I think it's wrong to say that you have a rating before you achieved it. But, you know, I can certainly look back and say, boy, I was doing a lot of chess all through college, all for then. I was definitely expert strength. But okay, and I proved it at the club. I'm beating this guy, I'm beating everyone else. I mean, it wasn't a very strong club. And um, anyway, when someone would ask who's the strongest player in the club, they would go to this guy, you know? And I'd be like, everyone sees me beating him all the time. You know, he's like, clearly not as strong as me. But because he had that number, you know, everyone's rating focus. Uh, it doesn't matter what I did, you know, uh, I'm, I'm not expert strength. So then I moved back um, to Long Island where that original club I told you about was. And uh, I very quickly went because now I could play rated tournaments without mm -hmm. having to, you know, travel after work and all that. Yeah. So um, I very quickly made expert because I was already expert strength. And the funny thing was all of a sudden, you know, my friends from Massachusetts would be like, what did you do? Like, what book did you read? What, you know, yeah. I'm like, I was already expert strength. I just moved, you know, but I think people are so latched into ratings. You are what your rating is and it doesn't matter you know, you, you might not have, not have played, you might have studied for a long time, your rating might drop, you might be getting stronger, but you don't have a chance to play, your rating might not go up, but no one really cares. You are what your rating is. But on an individual level, everyone knows that they're underrated and they should be higher and stuff. That's just the way chess works. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, that's basically my story. You know, came back here, made expert. Um, I, I was moving up a bit for a few years, you know, again, I'm always, this whole time I'm studying chess all the time because I love chess, um, you know, and um, I, I think the highlight, you know, just looking back, I'd have to look closely, but I won a futurity, a Fide futurity at, at my club ahead of uh, Samuel Warramantri, Hikaru Nakamura's yeah, dad, so like 2300 at the time or something. Mm -hmm. Arrow was in the tournament also. He was only 1,800 at the time. Though. But there were a lot of strong players. I took first place. And at that point, I'm pretty young. You know, I just moved back there. Now I just want a big futurity. My rating was over 2,200 feet. And um, it looked like, boy, you know, this guy is uh, on, on for bigger things. Particularly back then, because this was, uh, I don't know, the early 2000s. So, you know, it's not like today where you could do anything and you're not that impressive because everyone's good. Mm -hmm. But... Um, but then I, I got more and more into teaching chess. And, uh, you know, I always remember before I taught chess, I would always wonder why all these chess teachers don't play in tournaments. You know, like most chess teachers do not play in tournaments. And now I, I certainly realize because what it is, is you're spending the whole time teaching these kids chess. You're preparing lessons for them. If you like to study chess like I do, you're still studying, but not like studying like, you know, um, to improve your tournament play. you just like, hey, I want to look at the Capo Mike World Championship, or hey, this new chess book came out, it looks really interesting. You know, when, when you're when you're playing in a tournament, you're like, I'm going to play Tom Oz, you know, on, you know, next Wednesday, he plays the Carol Kahn defense, I better be up on that. And that's more like work. So, um, so basically, I mean, it was an unconscious thing, nothing planned. But at that point, I really didn't improve that much since then, you know, it definitely... You know, and I don't mind, I don't have any regrets or anything, but certainly I think if I had like a real job, uh, well, not a real job, I do have a real job, but if I, instead of being into teaching chess, I was, okay, I have a master's in social work. I was doing something in that, for example, working five days a week, then I'd have my chess game. I didn't get to play much chess, you know, because I was doing social work the whole week, 
and, and I'd really be into it and I'd play and it probably would have been better for my chess. But when a chess teacher is doing chess the whole time, to then have to go and often against lower rated players, especially the chess teachers who are like grandmasters, or you know, it's just it's very hard to do. You, you know, your whole life's chess now. You know, you're working chess, you're playing chess, you're preparing for chess. You know, um, so that's that's why um, I think it, it affected you know in terms of improvement from it. And, I, and I, again, I don't you know I'm not complaining or anything. I'm really happy that I, I love chess and I like teaching kids and it's all worked out well. But definitely uh you know if you're in terms of my chess story i'd have to mention that and other than that um you know i don't you know obviously we can go day by day you know but that's the broad overview of my story i would say mm -hmm. okay. oh i should also mention um as i kind of alluded to with alan Cantor, i was into online chess right from the beginning one of the first people first admins on the internet chess club one of the first members there you know, when, I'm just I'm very into chess. So and I'm and I like computers a lot also. So any basically any chess advance you can mention, I was early on in. You know, like if I heard of a chess site like chess.com, you know, boom, I'm on there like way before anyone else because I'm into chess and I'm always keeping an eye out for these things. So all through, um, you name it, like I was one of the first chess space users. Um, you know, in the 1980s. Um, I can go on and on. So that also is, I guess, part of my chess story. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for the introduction. And in the mm -hmm. meantime, I would like to ask you about some of the, let's say, stuff that you mentioned, because as we will see in a moment, you are just very, very experienced with all of the activities related to teaching, to studying, to reading, to being an administrator of the uh, Facebook groups, chess groups, and so on. And in the meantime, before we get into the next uh, stuff, I would like you to ask about a general overview about how much the technology has changed since, since the, let's say, 1970s, 1980s. If you just give us a little bit interview okay. how much it, it has advanced up to it the moment we have so far mm -hmm. so i mean um of course the 1970s is a little bit before my time as i said i got into it in 1984 so but obviously i've, I've read about it um you know uh, the 1970s was uh that was sort of the informant era you know they, they they would call a lot of these players children's of the informant and um you know, so they would, that was a big thing at the time, you know, you know, being able to get the games in one book that you had to study. And um, obviously magazines played a big part, you know, Bobby Fischer is famous for going through like hundreds of magazines all the time. And, um, you know, that's, that's basically how you did your chess. If you're, particularly if you're a pro player. I remember I was reading someone, um, forget who it was. It was like a top player around Bobby Fischer's time. Um, and he basically said, well, I wish I could remember who this was, that he um, he was like right on top of the openings along with Bobby Fischer. He says there were like maybe eight or nine people in the U.S. who were, you know, following the chess magazines and the informants. And just by doing that, he was like a great opening theoretician time. Because mm -hmm. even the other top players in the U.S., other than these eight or nine guys, they weren't doing that. They weren't keeping on track of the latest informants and latest magazines. So he had a big, huge advantage in the openings because of them. Um, you know, and of course, Bobby Fischer was doing it, which is funny today because today that would be like the minimum you could do. Um, so that that was a big fact. I think Bobby Fischer's shadow over the whole 1970s was huge. You know, everyone was playing the Nadorf and King's Indian and trying to play like him, complaining about lighting, uh, you know, all this stuff. And then towards the later end of the 70s, I think Karpov's approach was starting to predominate where you were kind of playing for small advantages and you know, uh, there was a lot of draws in tournaments and, you, you know, just uh, so the world champion always has a big fact, um, big impact on how people play chess. Then once you get to the 80s, obviously Kasparov and Karpov, their their matches were just dominant, you know, and really affected things. And Kasparov in particular was showing, um, you know, what they call dynamic play. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's funny, um, again, and I think you study chess too. All for chess. Now we can go back to Steinitz and Chigorin, right? Yeah. Steinitz was a positional player, believed in positional things. He called himself the new school. And Chigorin was the aggressive player, go for the initiative, Zukator a little bit also. Um, you know, play for dynamics, right? Yeah. You know, then you could go, you could move up. You could talk about like, you know, um, say Capablanca and Aliakin. You know, mm -hmm. Kavalak was a division player, Ali Ekman was a dynamic player, and everyone knows this, right? Yeah. Um, and Tao, you, you know, you can go on and on. And um, 
all of, you know, and then of course Casper and Carpo. And but yet, at all errors, they kind of say, we now realize that chess is, you know, you know, positional or dynamic, like what depending on what the error is. So in Carpo's mm -hmm. time, they learned modern chess is about playing for small advantages, and then Casper comes around. Modern chess is about seizing the initiative. And then I got a laugh um, in the press conference recently uh, with Ding Liren. Um, he said that the sacrifice for initiative is part of modern chess. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, Morphe knew a little bit about sacrificing for the initiative. So, I mean, there's no doubt that chess is getting, um, that chess players of later times are more sophisticated and stronger. Um, but it is kind of funny how they're constantly either saying, well, now we know positional chess better, or now we know dynamics. When the players all around, it's always been a clash between dynamics and positional chess. So um, I, I think, you know, I mean, I, I get what they mean. I understand why Kasparov's chess in the 80s was, was different than earlier. But, um, you know, but sometimes the way it's explained makes it seems like the players before him, like, knew nothing. You, you know, it's like, oh, he discovered dynamic chess. So, well, you know, <laughs> dynamic chess existed before Kasparov. Maybe not as well. Maybe he does it in a more advanced way. Mm -hmm. But we all know about dynamic chess. But anyway, the 80s was uh, definitely Kasparov and, and a lot of the uh, newer openings. Uh, I think Kasparov wrote that book on it. I think it started in the 70s, you know, the hedgehog defense and things like that. Um, and that that was the 80s again. And also in the 80s was um, when computers were starting to have their sort of first impact. They had some early chess spaces then. And you you know computers were good enough for error checking, mm -hmm. um, you know, so you could use it. And I think Kasparov did, um, even though they still weren't that strong. They would catch tactics. So, yeah. uh, you know, there's there's a rumor that it, um, Hans Berliner, their correspondence chess champion, mm -hmm. he won. I think he was the only one to win with a perfect score to become world champion. This was in, I don't know, the late '60s or something. I don't know when he became correspondence champion, but. It's a long time ago. Now he he eventually was head of high tech, one of the top supercomputers, yeah, yeah. and he had some early versions uh, back then, which were of course terrible. But um, you know, because it was so long ago. Mm -hmm. But um, there is a rumor. I don't know if it's true or not. I forget where I read it or heard about it. That he had a very early version that even though it was a bad player, it could find like blunders. You know, so that helped him become world correspondence champion because whatever he played, he put it through that cloud computer. To find any you know gross blunders mm -hmm. um, so i don't know if that's true or not but anyway definitely by the 80s you had computers like that yeah. um so yeah that's that's what i would say um mm -hmm. would be the 80s and then the 90s of course it started the internet became much more powerful yeah uh, you know and you had um in the 90s uh what else was there um you know, you, now you had Twix, Mark Crawford's uh, The Week in Chess. So, mm -hmm. you know, you could very quickly find your um, game. So if, if some grandmaster played a novelty, all of a sudden all the other grandmasters would know about it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the computers were getting stronger. Um, like uh, in 95, I think this game um, where Kasparov beat Anand in game 10 with this really neat Rila Pez novelty, that was one of the first, like, real uses of the computer, Kasparov. Mm -hmm really used the computer to come up with this amazing novelty. I mean, it was probably his idea, but the check it and stuff. And um, he credited the computer with that. And, you know, of course, now it's commonplace. But back then, it was kind of a, a newer thing to use the computer that well. Um, and then once you get to the 2000s, it's just the computers, uh, you know, having more and more of an impact. But then we knew they were better than us. And, uh, you know, that's that's pretty much, I would say, uh, you know, and, and obviously all the things are getting better. People are learning more from it. You know, here's one story. So, Alexander Kalifman, the Grandmaster, former sort of world champion, he came out with a book on um, the opening according to an ad. Mm -hmm. And my friend, um, Dennis Monacros, this speedy master, runs the Chess Mind blog. We were pretty good friends. Um, he uh, he laughed at me because uh, he says, oh, Anand destroyed your line. There's a certain line that I play a lot, or at least did back then. And he says, and he says, not Anand destroyed, Kalifman in the book. He, mm -hmm. he goes over the exact line that I play a lot, and he says he destroyed it, right? So now, normally, in the pre-computer age, you know, that would be it. You know, my argue with Grandmaster Kalifman, he's a million times stronger than me. But what I did is I put the, the final position he had in his line on my computer, let it run for a while, went back, another reply, and went and kept looking until I could find something. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, I busted his bust. Oh. And again, 
I don't take credit for it. I didn't do anything but use my computer effectively. But that's the difference between, um, you know, today's era and the past era. In the mm -hmm. past era, you know, I have no chance. The guy's a world champion. And, well, I mean, some people dispute that, but mm -hmm. whatever it is, he's a very strong grandmaster. Um, whereas I'm just, you know, candidate master. So, um, yeah, so, but uh, using the computers, you know, it's like the great equalizer. And, you know, there's another funny thing with this. Gary Kasparov came into the Simo on Long Island. Yeah. And I think this is something he does in a lot of his simuls. He said you cannot play if you're above two thousand. Yeah, his rule. Which is which is like insane. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, he's not so much stronger. But Kasparov's rationale was that, um, you know, someone I guess like me could look up his openings and might be lucky enough to catch him in something, and then you know win the game. Which of course I think is a little bit paranoid. You know, yeah. I mean. The chances of that happening are pretty small. But that's what he said. But I like it because now I can always mention the Simul of people. Oh, you know, I went to the Casper of Simul, and, you know, and they'll always say something like, oh, how'd you do, or this or that. And I get to look them in the eye and very honestly reply, I couldn't play because he said I was too strong. Oh. <laughs> right? I'm not lying. So um, that was pretty funny. But uh, okay, so where where are we at? Um, yeah, so I think the '80s and uh, you know the '90s and 2000s mostly just uh, one other thing I have to say that I think is very different from the '80s chess, mm -hmm. early '80s and '70s, yeah. and nowadays is chess has become, um, or at least it can become, mm -hmm. much more you against yourself, trying to work towards uh, perfection in a sense. It's not that anyone's ever going to achieve it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the past, it was more about you against your opponent. Let me explain what I mean by that. Okay. I played someone, you know, again, in the pre-computer eras, early 1980s and 70s and stuff, um, you know, and I win or lose. Generally, you know, that, that's that's my goal. My goal is to win. You know, we'll look over the game. Neither of us really knows the truth of it. I mean, if I win because of some horrible blunder, you know, okay, then we might know. But, you know, there will be a lot you don't know about the game. So it's basically the focus is on just beating your opponent. But now I can play a game. And immediately after the game, you know, turn on this super stockfish program. Mm -hmm. And um, I can, instead of really fighting against my opponent in a way, I can compare myself with stockfish. So it's like, how close did I get to playing the right moves, you know, and, and see exactly how wrong my moves were. So it could be more about me, like trying to push me towards perfection. Not that me or anyone's ever going to achieve perfection, even Magnus Carlsen, but it's it's more, you have that ability to test yourself, not necessarily against your opponent, but against how well you did against what's close to the ultimate truth, what, mm -hmm. what Stockfish says. Yeah. Whereas you didn't have that in the past. So I think that was a change. It's also a sad change in the sense that uh, there was a little bit more mystery to chess and, and you can debate things, particularly, I know Kasparov and Karpov debated uh, some opening position or, or a middle game position or something where one said they were winning and another one said they weren't. Um, and, uh, you know, you had that Steinitz and Chigorin, you know, also had a lot of arguments that way. And Zukertort, uh, Willie Hendricks just wrote a book about it. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of mystery, that, which was nice. You know, you could say, oh, hey, I think, you know, Rook C1's winning. And then Thomas could say, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't know for sure. And we just send analysis back and forth. And, and that's, that's kind of gone. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, you have what I just said, where you could kind of just compare yourself against perfection and just try to get closer and closer to it. Yeah, I got it. And especially I really appreciate it because you just uh, show us the idea how it uh, advanced some, some step by step. And in the meantime, I would like to ask you a little bit because I know and in a moment uh, you probably confirm that you are one of the moderators at ICC, Internet Chess Club. And if you give yes. us a little bit of insight, how the first, uh, let's say, chess websites in the sense of chess portals, but in the sense of, uh, let's say, playing websites has emerged at in the same time, if we can give us a little bit of insight into how the fix free internet chess server was done with all of this, uh, let's say, ICC creation, because fix is one of the branch of ICC, if I'm not mistaken. Not ICC, ICS. So, so the way chess started, um, I was playing on an online server, the Imagination Network. So these online servers, they weren't quite the internet. It was like a private company. You'd pay like per hour to play. It's generally kind of expensive. And, um, it wasn't like what we knew as the internet. I mean, it was in a sense, you know, it was computers connected, but again, it was like AOL or something like that. Mm -hmm. But um, 
So anyway, um, I got to know Marty Grund, um, who was on the Imagination Network. And it, it, we would, you know, we'd talk, we'd play this and that. And then eventually he found a new place called the Internet Chess Server, ICS. Mm-hmm. Actually, I had not realized it, but I had gone on ICS in the 80s when I was at, at my college. Um, they had the supercomputers at the college, you know, which are obviously terrible compared to today's computers. But um, I was able to play people. You know, I went on it. It had the way it would work is you type like, let's say I was playing you where you're in Poland or something. Yeah. So you could be in Poland. The person I remember playing was in Chile. Mm-hmm. And I would type E2, E4 into the terminal, hit return. Mm-hmm. And it, I don't even know if it was on the screen. It would come out this dot matrix printout of the board with my move, E4. And then it would also show your response, a new text board printed with E5. And when I say a text board, it was just literally like lines, you know, like from the dot matrix printer in the form of a chessboard. Like it wasn't any sort of graphics and they'd have like P for pawn or something. Mm -hmm. I might have, I gotta check, I might have one of the old ones. Anyway, um, so that was the early ICS. So, but then I, I, I didn't, you know, I did a little bit in college, graduated college, went on to work. And then again, I was with Marty Grund on Imagination Network. And he started going on to the more advanced version of ICS because now like five or six years had passed. And um, he came back, he told me, oh, you know, this is great and it's free, you know, mm-hmm. uh, which again, I was paying a lot of money for it. So I went on there also, and that was ICS, it was totally free. People were playing chess back then. I remember when a- a man came on, it was a big deal. Before then, like, no, you know, I mean, Mark Ginsburg, international master Mark Ginsburg was on, it was probably the strongest player on and off, um, I'm saying list, uh, you know, so some people, but there weren't really a lot of strong players. Um, if anyone gets Joel Benjamin's old magazine, Chess Chow, he actually talked about it a lot in his magazine. Mm-hmm. That was about as much exposure as it got. Um, but anyway, uh, what happened eventually, um, so with ICS, they had problems with lag, where you'd be, you'd send your move, and, and if I was playing you, my move might take four seconds to arrive to you, mm-hmm. and I'd be penalized for that. And your move might take quicker say and you wouldn't be penalized so even though we had the same time control you know it wouldn't be fair and people would lose they'd be sitting there thinking they have plenty of times and all of a sudden they'd flag and lose so uh, daniel slater um he was a professor at carnegie mellon university a computer professor a very good computer scientist um Mm -hmm. and he uh fixed that he created a way to stop the lag um something called timestamp so Mm -hmm. now you can actually play without lag and he upgraded the server in many ways and eventually, I think they even moved it to Carnegie Mellon. And um, computer stopped. And um, but then, at a certain point, they, everyone wanted to. There were a bunch of people who wanted to buy ICS from him. Mm-hmm. Now, technically, there was argument over whether he owned ICS. You know, because again, it was sort of like a public thing. Um, but in a sense, he did at that point because he contributed so much to it. I don't. It was a whole legal thing. I mean, they talked to lawyers and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. In a sense, he was the owner at that point. Um, although maybe some people would argue there were there were two different people who actually created it. He didn't actually create ICS. There were mm-hmm. some other people on the internet. You can look it up who created it. But Danny, you know, was doing all this work. Those other two people weren't that involved at this point. And he did all this work on ICS. Um, so when people said that they were gonna uh, buy it, um, he eventually said, hey, you know, I don't want to sell it but I think we should charge money for it. Mm. And that was a big controversy at the time. Mm-hmm. So uh, you had a lot of people said, no, you shouldn't charge money for it. Now his argument was, I'm going to take that money. I'm going to make the server even better. We're going to cover events. We're going to do all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but in any case, that's when the split happened. So you had Fix, the pre-internet, pre-internet chess server. Yeah. And they did their thing. Many of them were admins, like co-admins with me, because we were all among the first admins on ICS. Mm-hmm. They split. Some of them went over to um, Fix and and started that, and then um, you know the other one stayed at ICC and and helped work there. And I would say in the beginning, um, Danny really did do a good job with uh, taking that money, putting it into covering chess events, upgrading the server. Whereas Fix was kind of stagnant because they didn't have much money. I mean, they did some things, but nothing compared to what ICC was doing. At a certain point. You know, and I don't know all the details why this happened or not, but Danny was, uh, he hired a lot of CEOs who really weren't into chess. 
they just were like they were MIT graduates or this or that. They had impressive resumes, but they weren't really chess lovers. I think that was a mistake, personally. Um, I think he could have found some people who are very capable and really love chess, sort of like the people who started chess.com. This Eric, um, I don't know too much about him, but he obviously loves chess and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and Danny Wrench and stuff, you know, so they love chess and they're capable people. That's what I think would have really helped uh, uh, ITC at the time. Um, I know me and many of the admins were protesting various things. The one, the one big one was they used to have an ICC um, guest accounts. So even though you couldn't become a member by paying, uh, were you into chess at this time? Yeah, you, yeah, I was, I was, uh, sorry, I, I was a little bit later at Fix because I uh, used to play at Fix uh, from the 2000, uh, let's say 11 up to, two, uh, sorry, 2007 up to 2014. This, this okay, was, so was much later. Yeah, you were on much later, later, but I know the fix the community because I play in the league uh, of many of the teams, and therefore I know a little bit of community, right? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, the, the part this part probably wasn't later. When you got into 2007, is about when all this was going on. Because what happened was, um, so this guy uh, Joel Perez is his name. He was CEO at the time. He was spending all sorts of ICC money, flying all over and stuff like that. And you know, I mean, I don't know exactly what he did, but. You know, he graduated from MIT, he knew stuff, uh, you know, he, he had an impressive resume. Um, but in any case, uh, he made the decision, you know, along with the rest of ICC, I guess, uh, you know, who, the people running it, um, to remove guest accounts, mm -hmm. you know, get rid of the freebies. And basically, if you want to be on ICC, you had to pay. Yeah. Now, I remember I sent an email, and not just me, obviously other admins, you know, basically saying, this is not a good idea. You know, this is like a really bad idea. I don't think I phrased it very tactfully, you know, but, um, but, you know, basically don't do that. And, and ironically at this exact time, now I had mentioned in my email about, um, chess spaces. Uh, they had their own server, uh, play chess, mm -hmm. right. And yeah. I mentioned play chess, but I was also semi aware of chess.com. This was before chess.com was really well known. Mm -hmm. But it was well known that servers like chess.com were starting. Play chess at that time seemed like the big one. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned, you know, if you do this, like right now, ICC had the market share. Like everyone, even the guests would just go to ICC because that's where all the best players play. That was the most well known one. And I said, you know, if you do this, what, what's going to happen is you're going to make all these former guests. Some of them will join. But a large percent of them are going to feed, I think I mentioned play chess, but it, it, looking back, it could easily have been chess.com because that's what happened. Mm -hmm. the, the players said, hey, we're not paying for this. They went to chess.com, um, you know, and probably other places. And now ICC at first had a little bit of a bump because some of the guests did join ICC and paid it. They said, look, you know, it's a great idea. But um, they didn't realize it was one, one big step in the wrong direction. And then, as I said, um, Danny Wrench and Eric, I forget his last name, the, the one who runs chess.com, um, you know, it, that was another thing they were doing. So admins like me, and you know, I don't want to pretend like it's just me, this, we're, there are all sorts of ICC admins, were always pushing for all sorts of ideas. Now, of course, it was easy for us to say we weren't paying money, we didn't have to look into the programming aspect of it and everything. But we were saying, you know, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Because we're looking at it from a chess fan's perspective. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, I don't know all the details, you know, behind the, you know, what was going on in the administration there or not. I don't know, you know, their personal lives, their personal finances. But for whatever reason, ICC was not really that concerned. They, they just, everything was going well. They didn't see any reason to put a lot of money into new features and, and all this other stuff. Um, also, another big advantage chess.com had is they were web-based. ICC had to download a program, mm -hmm. which I think made it a little bit harder for people to get on it. So in any case, you know, unfortunately for ICC, as we all know at this point, even though they had like a huge head start and a huge part of the market share mm -hmm. of chess, you know, now it's all chess.com and LA chess, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I think if, if you could go back in time and, you know, put in the right CEOs, put in, you know, kind of cater to the membership a little bit more, the features and things like that. Um, I mean, it might have been very, you know, I don't, again, I, I'm not on there. Um, there's a lot of stuff I don't know from the finance aspect and things like that. You know, they, they would have to um, do a lot of work if they were going to be like chess.com. But remember, they had a huge head start over chess.com. So they mm -hmm. had more capital in the beginning and more 
you know, possible um, programming stuff. They already had a ton of features on their server. I think the big thing they would have had to do is make a free option and also uh, make a web-based. Uh, they might have even had web-based then, but I don't think it was very well done. Mm -hmm. And because of that, that's like a huge uh, miss for, you know, I, see, I mean, they're still around. They're doing tournaments now and stuff, and they still exist. But obviously, as you know, chess.com and LHS are... Not only are they bigger, but they're making, I don't, well, of course, LHS technically isn't making money, but chess.com, you know, huge amounts of money. So they definitely got their investment back. Yeah, yeah, I fully agree. At the meantime, if I can add a little bit uh, into that stuff that you just mentioned, it was the, uh, let's say, popularity about ICC, because I'm in the chess community for 27 years. Therefore, I know a little bit about, about it. And I sure. just experienced that uh, ICC was pretty popular back then when they were the free accounts, as you just mentioned. And at the same time, there was some, uh, let's say, of the videos, I mean, recorded uh, back then by the, let's say, strong players, and the part of the videos were for the public consumption, if I can say that, right? And therefore, we just... I mean, from ICC. Yes, from ICC. And therefore, yes, we just they did that, yeah. boosted the popularity, but at some point, as you just mentioned, they just cut it off. There was no free accounts. You need to pay, or for example, you have just free yeah, account for yeah. seven days. After that, you need to pay or you cannot play. And Chesscom, Chesscom model or financial model or strategy, call it whatever you wish, you you can have the free account, you can do, let's say, 70% of all of the stuff that is like the membership, and membership is some like additional uh, opportunity to learn, to make more puzzles, to make more analysis, deeper yeah. analysis, so on, right? Some like extension, right? Yeah, they, they really messed up with that. Again, because I think part of it is the people running the company we're not chess player. They didn't even really necessarily mm -hmm. like chess. Yeah. And so they can't relate from a fan's perspective. So if you or I hear that they're cutting off videos for free accounts, you know, we know what that means. We, mm -hmm. we know how that affects things, what a huge step that is. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the people might, you know, who are running it might be like, oh, well, you know, it's not a big deal. You know, and, they, and again, they, they just, they didn't get it. You know, it was sort of like if someone hired me, let's say I had a good economics background, this and that. But they hired me to run a lingerie company you know like i don't know anything about lingerie you know they, you'd hire someone some woman or someone to do it so it was the same thing here they i think they underappreciated how important it was mm -hmm. to be a fan a real fan of chess and listen you know a lot of the people who are who are chess players are very smart capable people you know the the, the um stereotype is they're like fisher and just obsessed with chess and mm -hmm. have all these eccentricities there's a lot of ivy league graduates who are chess players there are you know, there's no shortage of capable chess players, but for whatever reason, um, they mostly didn't hire CEOs who liked chess uh, mm -hmm. or at least were involved in chess. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, I don't think ICC is the only company. But I think there's a lot of chess companies that do that. And maybe it works out for some of them, but I think, uh, you know, if, if you're hiring a CEO or someone to work in the chess world, yeah, there are a lot of centric chess players and you, you might have to, you know, shy away from them. But you should be able to find someone, and you really do want that, because they're going to be able to relate to the fan. And again, chess.com, I think, is a perfect model, because it's very clear Danny Ranch and Eric... By the way, you Eric know, Alibest. Love chess. Alibest. You know, Eric Alibest is the surname. Eric yeah, then, Alibest. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. He loves chess. You know, he, yeah. he, I don't know him very well, I, you know, I, I, but, um, you know, it's very clear he loves chess, and I'm glad. I'm glad that someone who loves chess is... Uh, you know, not only making his dream come true, but a lot of the, you know, I mean, listen, I love chess.com and I love LI chess. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a nice little amusement park to me. So, um, yeah, I think that's the big lesson from that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. And I guess uh, we have just explored this uh, word of, uh, let's say, chess servers about, uh, let's say, chess community online. And in a moment, we'll get mm -hmm. into the next part because we are just having sure. some parts to be discussed. Sorry some parts of the discuss and now let's get into the part about learning chess as the kid because in a moment we'll uh, let's say uh, mentioned that you are uh, one of the let's say chess teacher chess coach chess instructor that you are just have a lot of experience you can just share what kind of this experience and how it is like to have let's say the kid and if you are for example the parent or the kid uh, if you have the kid as the cousin let's say how it is uh, going to be to have a good start or the best start for such a kid and how it is feel like to make the let's say chess uh, for the let's say intellectual growth at the same time at the same time social growth for the kid as for example four or five year old or for a five year old mm -hmm. if you just start uh, well, something like from the beginning yeah okay um so i mean you know, parents, um, 
I think one of the fun things, maybe challenges of being a parent is you get to choose, you know, how you raise your kid and what values you instill. And as long as they're not, you know, you know, insane values, you know, that's 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 good, you know, and, and they can be a reflection. Um, so it really depends. You get some parents who want their kids to be, you know, very successful with whatever they do. Mm-hmm. You know, chess might be a pathway, even at five years old, to, you know, eventually become super and you get into Ivy League school and all that stuff. Um, then you have other parents who chess is like one thing they do between, you know, piano and karate, mm-hmm. you know, one sort of activity. I personally lean, especially at five years old, towards that range. And I know Magnus Carlsen's dad was like this too. Mm-hmm. You know, it's sort of like at five years old, you know, the first question is, does the kid want to do it? Does he find it interesting? So mm-hmm. Magnus Carlsen, I think the dad, Henrik, um, first tried to get Magnus exposed to chess at like six years old. He showed mm-hmm. him the game because Henrik was a tournament player. And Magnus just wasn't that interested. Mm-hmm. Then around eight, on his own, Magnus really got into it. He wanted to be the sister. I imagine he did that. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and the whole time Henrik makes clear, you know, in whatever interviews he gives or books, that he never pushed on. It was always Magnus's direction. Mm-hmm. And, um, so certainly for a five-year-old, I think um, there should be some of that. But but at the same time, there is a caveat. Um, a five-year-old... You know, he might say he doesn't like it at first without really knowing what it's about, you mm-hmm. know. They're, so so that's where a good coach comes in or, you know, whether it's an uncle or a parent or whoever it is, to present chess in such a way that the kid will like it. Yeah. Um, there's no way of guaranteeing that, you know, it depends on the kid. I will say I've had some classes where you'll have like, a, you know, a five-year-old kid and some of the five-year-old kids are fine. And other kids, you could see, they're just not ready for it. They might be, just like Magnus, they might go on to be very strong players, but at five years old, it's just too young. Mm-hmm. And you'll see them very antsy in their seats, and, you know, just it's just they're, they're not ready. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, every five-year-old, you know, might be very ready. Mm-hmm. Um, so it really depends at five years old. Um, but, um, you know, the main thing is, uh, do they enjoy it? You know, can you find a way to to present it to them that they enjoy it Mm -hmm. don't go too quickly you know don't you know that's the other thing Uh, a lot of people and this i was doing this when i first started um teaching back in the late 90s um i would take you know a five-year-old or even someone a little bit older and i'd just try to teach them all the rules as quickly as possible like Mm -hmm. all the pieces as quickly as possible yeah and i would be able to kind of get them to be able to do it after one or two classes you know, they, they sort of, we went through all the pieces and they sort of, you know, knew how to do it. But what would happen is they would forget it or, you know, they, they couldn't maintain it. Mm-hmm. And then years later, um, one of my students was trying to teach me Chinese chess. Oh. And Chinese chess is similar to regular chess, except the pieces move in different ways, mm-hmm. right? So you have yeah. a lot of different pieces like chess that move in different ways. Yeah. And, you know, that, that was sort of my karma because... I got to see what, you know, what it's like, you know, trying to learn all these pieces, you know, so it's sort of like I was a beginner. This is how beginner chess players, it, you know, obviously, I take it for granted how a rook moves or a knight moves here. I just showed you how the knight moves. Why can't you do it? You know, it's easy to be from that perspective. But in learning Chinese chess, I was like, wait, this is pretty tough to remember everything. But in any case, um, you know, I think a good chess coach, particularly for a five-year-old, they're going to go very slowly for the pieces and make sure that kid knows the if it takes a whole class to get them to know a rook or a knight whatever you know that's fine the main thing is however long it takes at the end they really know it before you introduce another piece mm-hmm. and you go extremely slow you don't put all the pieces on the board just the pieces they know i like to do it where um i'll show them the king first and then I'll show them, say, the rook, and then I'll have I'll show them different checkmates with the rook, mm-hmm. and then they'll have to do it, and they'll have to create those positions, and then only when I'm sure they know that king and rook do we now go on to a different piece. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that's important in turn, because if, if you do, you know, um, introduce them to chess in the wrong way, or you know, they might not like it when they would have, you know. But at the same time, if they don't like it. Okay, you know, they might not be ready for it. Maybe they're just the type of person that doesn't like it, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. Now, the other thing I should mention, yeah, you do have so through coaching, you have kind of a, a continuum. Mm-hmm. You have the type of coach I would say if we go to one end of the continuum, mm-hmm. right? 
who would be sort of like the off chess author Irving Chernin. Yeah, uh, the Irving. chess coach is mainly about enthusiasm, teaching you to love the game, this and that. Um, now, at the other end would be someone like Deborah Retsky. Mm -hmm. At that point, you know, you better love the game because you know, he's not doing anything with that with you. You know, you don't love the game too bad. Mm -hmm. It's all about very deep um, study, professional approaches and that. Yeah. Now, you do have, uh, for some of these kids, a lot of them who win world championships uh, for their age group, five, six, whatever it may be, um, who are sort of on their path. Mm -hmm. Like, their parents are like, I want my kid to be the best. Yeah. And um, my, my, you know, again, it's a parent's prerogative, it, you know, to decide, you know, how, what they want to do with a five or six year old or even a teenager, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, they're the parent. And as I said, as long as they're not, you know, teaching them to be like a murderer or something, mm -hmm. it's their right to, to raise their kid how they want. Um, but they do have to realize uh, what's going to come with it. Because a lot of them think, you know, if they hire someone like Brian Carroll, or, you know, even Mark the Rescue, whatever it is that, you know, they, they'll see him once an hour and they'll become world champion. Mm -hmm. As we know, I, I remember reading an article by um, this GM, I forget his name, but he's like the top GM for teaching kids. He had multiple world champions and he was talking about his training of a six-year-old. Actually, you know who the six-year-old was? It was that kid who went on to be the youngest grandmaster. Oh, um, again, everyone, I'm forgetting everyone's name at this point, but you know that John Buster from America Mishnah, Mishnah. Yes, Mishnah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, his first coach. Yeah, um, I, I should know his name too. A very good coach mm -hmm. for this type of coaching. And basically, uh, in the article, they said um, Mishra was studying something like six hours a day, mm -hmm. in first grade. You know, first grade, six hours a day. And listen, if you want your kid to be world champion. You have to accept. You're yeah. going to have to do something this like that. This is dedication you know? and sacrifice, right? Yeah. And listen, who am I to argue? You know, it's it's their parents' choice. It's their child. Um, I personally wouldn't want to do that. My child, you know, I, I think I'd want to be more rounded. The other thing, you know, that I worry about with all these prodigies is I have no idea what chess is going to be like in 10 years by mm -hmm. the time they grow up. Because listen, you know, AI is becoming very powerful. There's cheating's now a thing. Um, there's all sorts of stuff. So I don't know what the chess world, uh, we see Magnus isn't playing the world champion. You know, who knows what's going to be happening in chess in 10 years. Hopefully it'll be more or less like it is today. And if you put all that work into it. But the other thing I feel bad for is let's say you have a whole bunch of five and six year olds or even teenagers studying six hours a day, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Now, one of them will be world champion, right? Mm -hmm. But what about the kids who like finish second or third or 10th? Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they put all that work in, you know, it's a. Uh, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, again, that wouldn't be my pick. Well, the way I see for chess, uh, what I think is best are, um, I, I have some kids, I've been teaching long enough. I have some kids who are like in their early 30s or late 20s now. Mm -hmm. who I see and they have regular jobs. A lot of them went to really good schools and, you know, they have families in some cases. Yeah. And they're like, you know what, Brian? I really love chess. I'm on chess.com. This mm -hmm. is my handle. I play all the time. Yeah. And to me, that's job well done. You know, you know because the chess is a wonderful hobby. And, um, you know, if, if the, that's what I'd want to get from my kid. Now, if the kid shows super talent or this or that, you know, again, if you're the parent, uh, you might say, listen, again, Magnus Carlson example, you know, you might say, okay, my, my child's special and, you know, and he really loves it and I think he can go far. Mm -hmm. Then I think, you know, then it might be reasonable to decide, you know, I don't know how many hours you want him to work, but you know, he has a chance. So so it's up to you. And, and if he's on board, then, then why not, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. And I am curious about uh, one specific uh, stuff, if we just talking about this, because it's pretty interesting. If, for example, the parents can recognize and the parents decide that they are kids, uh, they are, kids are going to be strong players for whatever reason, what would be the uh, proper I would say education, some like proper activities, proper plan to make it work. For example, to make it work, to not invest all of the money in the world and at the same time, not to make any harm for the kid, making some like a smooth transition from the, let's say, uh, beginning player up to intermediate, up to advanced and maybe up to the master. What are the, let's say, universal methods, maybe universal plans, if you can get us a little bit into this, because it's a little bit controversial topic as well. So you're saying you have a kid, you're, you're a parent, mm -hmm. and you have a child at five or six, mm -hmm. 
And what would be the plan to map out for them to become a grandmaster? Mm -hmm. that for example, grandmaster, or maybe a little bit more uh, uh, pl plastic, uh, plastic way. For example, if the, uh, let's say, kid would be very strong player, let's say, FIDE master, international master, but at the same time, to get the kid the path to get into, let's say, the science. For example, if the kid is not going to be the best player in the America, right, we can get into the study, let's say, economics, maybe technology, maybe science, maybe some kind of STEM, uh, let's say, subject, something like having a little bit of work if the kid is not going to excel some like top of the top in chess these uh, skills that were due to let's say getting into the mastery could be got into the other track so you're saying building up skills through chess that they could use in mm -hmm. other areas yeah 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 they especially science out. especially science in a global way right. mm -hmm. well i mean i think uh you know the, the good news is i think chess is uh Maybe, maybe an ideal way to learn how to challenge yourself and and improve. Um, you, you know, that's the thing about chess. Um, it teaches you decision making. It teaches you um, how to handle failure and learn from the failure. Mm -hmm. That's why I think a lot of chess players go on to play poker and, and do very well in it because they know how to do that. Not necessarily poker players going into chess. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it really works um, with chess. So, I mean, I think it will, if you're good at chess, I think um, there's a very good chance you, uh, of course, The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin, mm -hmm. he wrote a yeah. book on it. Yeah. And of course, Josh, he was an international master, and then he transferred, that's what the book's about, he transferred his knowledge into becoming a martial arts champion. Mm -hmm. And I think even since then, he went on to something else that he was working on, something with um, surfing or something. Um, so yeah, I mean, you do learn how to learn. And I think really, if you get really good at any activity, you know what it is to, you, you have to do to get good at something else. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the, the certain thing as far as the chess, um, you know, I, I don't think it's really, um, like, like, like that hidden of a thing, you know, despite all the books and everything written. So basically you're going to play, um, you know, Preferably slower time controls, although you could get good nowadays with blitz. Mm -hmm. um, but whatever you play, um, you, you know, you're challenging yourself. You're playing as strong opponents as you can find. Mm -hmm. And then you're looking over the games. Again, nowadays we have the computer. Yeah. I would say it's probably best not to rely on the computer too much, that the computer's sort of going to check your games and, mm -hmm. you know, check your analysis, but it's better to analyze on your own first. See, that's, that's the one thing. A lot of people miss, um, use the computer. Yeah. So basically it's challenge, challenge, challenge. You, you're looking to challenge yourself, whether it's against an opponent or it could be a chess position you have. So yeah, and I have a problem with this also myself. So if you come to a position that you don't quite understand, mm -hmm. the natural reaction is to turn on the computer and just have the computer show you it, Yeah. right? But really, if you're trying to improve, the natural reaction should be, let me just tear this position to the bones, you know, mm -hmm. do, it, do it as, push myself as far as possible on it. Yeah. And then look at the computer. Mm -hmm. And you know, so so every time you, you don't do that with a position, you kind of miss out on a chance to improve your chess. Now, of course, sometimes you just want to know this. You're just not interested in improving yourself. You just want to know what's going on in the position. And then it's perfectly okay to use the computer. But basically, if you're looking to become, you know, what you just said, um, you have to challenge yourself at every opportunity. Analysis, um, you know, players. Um, so you're doing that. You're... Um, you should be doing a certain amount of, you know, puzzles, again, challenging puzzles every every day. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, you know, better to do one or two super challenging puzzles a day than like 20 in one day and on the other days. Like you want a consistent sort of thing. Playing a lot, looking over your games. When you look over your games, um, of course, you know, I mean, that's where chess coaching comes in. Or if you don't have a chess coach or can't afford one, it could be a stronger friend. Mm -hmm. But that, that really helps to, because of course you have Stockfish, which will help you point out tactics and stuff. But the co the good coach or the stronger friend might be able to just tell you in words, listen, you know, you're attacking too early or you're playing mm -hmm. too passively here. You know, they're going to be see, able to see things that they know from experience because they're stronger yeah. that you're doing wrong. And that's, of course, very helpful. Um, so you're playing a lot. You're, um, you know, you're honestly now. Now, chess books. That's another thing. I don't think chess books, as much as I'm a chess book collectors group and love chess books, it's not essential. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, you have two top players today, Akira Nakamura, 
who's kind of gone out of his way to say how he never reads chess books and he doesn't mm-hmm. think they're, they're that important. Exception. And Magnus Carlsen, who loves chess books. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not saying Magnus Carlsen as in if he won, he's the better player. Listen, they're both incredibly good, you know, yeah. so... You know, double, if a character was double. able to get as strong as he was without reading chess books, you know, it shows it can be done. Mm-hmm. So I think uh, now my personal feeling is, yeah, I think the chess books, obviously, I think they can be very helpful, mm-hmm. but they're not for everyone. So if you don't enjoy them and you'd rather just go for your games and use the computer tools, um, you know, you can obviously go very far with that. I, I have to say, though, what I don't understand, because it, it is possible to, to get really good at chess um, without really learning the chess culture much at all. Yeah. So I, just, I don't know if you saw my post in the chess book collectors game recently. I, I was talking to this seven-year-old with his dad, mm-hmm. and the seven-year-old is really into chess. The dad says he plays like hours every day. Mm-hmm. And I mentioned the World Championship. This is only like a couple of days ago mm-hmm. that, that this happened. And I mentioned the World Chess Championship, and not only was he not following the World Chess Championship, but he didn't even know it existed. He like had no idea. And this is a kid. I know you say he's seven years old, but he's been, you know, really working on his chess. He's he's something like mid fourteen hundreds on LA chess, which you know doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be the next, you know, Magnus Carlsen. But you know, clearly for a seven year old, that's a good rating. Um, and he loves chess, but um, he just has zero interest in the cultural stuff. And and I could I could see examples of other people, you know, who are older. Because nowadays, if you do a lot of puzzles online, and if you play a lot and look over your games online, mm-hmm. you can get really good. I think people made Grandmaster doing that, you, you know? Yeah. Um, so, but you don't have to know anything, really, about Capablanca or mm-hmm. the Ding, you know, Ding Nepo World Championship or that stuff. Now, my perspective is, yes, you can do it. But if you're spending all that time on chess, I think they're missing something. I, I think mm-hmm. it's like... You know, why wouldn't you want to do this? You know, why wouldn't you want to learn about this stuff? And, and the fact that you're a strong player, it's so much more interesting because you can actually, you know, understand what Rubenstein was doing back in, you know, um, 1912 or something. So um, so I don't think it's essential, but I do think if you like chess books, they can be very helpful. They're sort of, a, especially, they're in a coach in, in their own way. Like mm-hmm. a chess book can be a coach. I mean, it's not individual, like where they actually know your own strengths and weaknesses but it is sort of having the the chess offer of the book is sort of like a very experienced player giving you his advice in the book Mm -hmm. so i think that's very helpful also uh you know to if if people get into that um but really um you know it's uh i don't think the path is that like it's that people think that there's like some secret formula to getting good at chess Mm -hmm. It really isn't. It's just constantly challenging yourself as much as possible. I'd say, you know, doing some puzzles, playing challenging opposition, looking over the games. And then, of course, when you look over your games, if you notice certain weaknesses, then you address them. And there's always ways to address them, you know. Mm-hmm. So if you're weak end game, there's end game books. You know, if you're, you know, whatever it is, you'll find some way to to address it. But so so there's no secret. You know, it's, listen, you want to become world champion? If you're young enough and have the talent. Now, I will say this. To become, talent does exist. I had some arguments with philosophy student friend of mine who says talent doesn't exist. And mm-hmm. exists. It does not exist. Very good You know, but, um, but if you, I think it's more about reaching your potential. Mm-hmm. Everyone can reach their potential. And here's another thing that, that I've noticed as a chess teacher. Yeah. Um, you can have someone who's very talented at chess. Maybe Let's say a five-year-old, You because you were mentioning five-year-olds. Mm-hmm. You might have one five-year-old who's very talented at chess, another five-year-old who's not, right? Yeah. yeah. Now, actually, a better, let's say, just, let's say 12-year-olds a, okay. a little bit. Okay. Mm-hmm. I don't know, because five-year-olds, there's some special things about five-year-olds. Got it. But, okay, so let's say two 12-year-olds, right? Mm-hmm. They just learned mm-hmm. chess. One's very talented, one's not. Now, the 12-year-old who's very talented, he might very quickly become, you know, the best in his class, the best in among his friends, this and that. But if he continues on the tournament circuit, I don't care who he is, you know, even Magnus Carlsen at a certain point, you know, you reach a roadblock Mm -hmm. at a certain point where you're losing a lot and really devastating losses and you're playing people who are better than you. Now, the 12 year old who's very talented, he might just quit chess at that point Mm -hmm. or he might hate chess. You know, he he liked winning. He didn't like chess. Right. So he didn't really get much from chess if that happens. Like if he just plays, beats people easily and then quits chess. And and if anything, you know, he's probably going to be that in a lot of things where he just does something, isn't quite good enough at it and then quits. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. Now, you might have the much less talented player who's 12 year old. He likes chess. 
he's not that good. You know, it, every step up is very hard for him. Mm -hmm. But he's challenging himself. He's persevering. He's pushing himself to the limit. And I think he's getting a lot from chess, you know, beyond the chess. You know, he's developing his character. He's learning how to learn. And that'll help him in life. You know, maybe he, I don't know how good he'll get at chess, but that'll help him in life. And in some cases, he might get very good at chess. You know, who knows? But um, so, yeah, I mean, I think what you're getting out of chess isn't necessarily if you're more talented, you're going to get more out of it. It could actually backfire. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't even know what our questions are at this point. I'm kind no, of rambling it's, on. It's perfectly but... fine. Perfectly fine. Thank you very much. And we have one uh, of the questions from the chat, because sometimes I'll be addressing the questions from uh, the chat to you as well. Uh, the question is from our friend Mechiat2008. He's asking about the approach to chess and reaching the title. I'll just uh, quote the question of him. He says, if I really love chess and I went from 1000 to 1900 in one year, but I don't have the time to practice, do I have a chance to achieve a title? And let's say the title or candidate master or FIDE master. What would be the, let's say, chances oh, yeah. for that? So to go from 1000 to 1900 in a year mm -hmm. is like an incredible accomplishment. Yeah, and you'd have yeah. to be massively talented. You mm -hmm. know, massively. If you're doing that without putting much work in. Even if you're doing it with putting much work in, mm -hmm. but uh, without much work, you know, we're talking about world championship level talent. Like, I don't know how Magnus worked. I know he was eight when he started, but, you know, I don't think he got that far anywhere near that far in a year. Um, maybe, I don't know. I don't know where he got to. But he, he it's not like Magnus Carlsen, you know, in a year was all of a sudden a grandmaster and beating everyone. You know, he, he had a, he was quick. I mean, he was, he was a young grandmaster. Actually, I know he made grandmaster, I think, at 12 and he started at eight or something like that. So he, he did progress quickly, but still, you know, he had his own roadblocks. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go from 1000 to 1900, especially if you're doing it without much study in one year, yeah. um, then, you know, I think it's very possible you could make title player. Of it. You'd have to still keep playing a lot. You know, that's the other thing people don't get um, to some extent. You know, when we say playing a lot, like if you want to get a title, you know, this is not online play. You know, you're going to have to go mm -hmm. to tournaments. Like like a lot of people, they think that getting a title is only about your ability and how good you are. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't get titles because they just don't have the time for it, you yeah. know? Like, let's say, like, I'm I'm candidate master. I don't think I'm any stronger and, and I'm happy to be candidate master. But let's say for the sake of argument, I was much stronger than that, you, you know, uh, or I felt I was much stronger than that. To prove it, I'm going to have to play a lot of tournaments to get my rating up to whatever I want to get to. PDA Master, International Master, this is that, you know, you know, you know um, so it's, it would just, even if I was at strength, mm -hmm. it would take me a long time to do because I'd have to play in a lot of tournaments and uh, do very well in them. And of course, invariably, you're going to have some setbacks, isn't that? And when you play in these tournaments, you're going to be spending money. You're going to be, you know, now if you're a kid, you know, it might be all, the path might be easy for you. Your parents might you know, take you to tournaments, pay everything, pay your coaches and that. If you're an adult, you know, you're going to have to take time off from work, you know, the little vacation time you have, go mm -hmm. to some. See, that that's the other thing. Um, you know, the higher up you get in rating, the harder it is to yeah. find tournaments that will work for you, because especially nowadays, because, you know, all, everyone's getting so good with the computers. Mm -hmm. So it used to be, you know, if I played someone who was hundreds of points lower rated than me, or not, I shouldn't say me, if anyone played someone mm -hmm. hundreds of points lower rated than them, they're just going to win and generally pretty easily. Nowadays, that's not the case. You can play someone much weaker than you, and they might know their openings really well because they're playing online all the time and looking over their openings, and they might be pretty good at tactics and this and that. So you really don't have any easy opponents anymore. It's yeah. very rare, you know? So so now if, you're, if you want to get your title... You're gonna have to go out there. You know, you're probably not gonna be able to do it locally. You might, you might even, you know, start going back. You, you know, you, you got to find tournaments where people are mostly as strong or stronger than you. Which the higher up the ratings list you go, the harder it is. Like mm -hmm. in my case, if I wanted to really do this and believed I could, I'd have to go to these continental chess tournaments. You know, again, take off from work, pay for a hotel. You know, and, and there's some people who do this and play a bunch of games. I have to play like, you know. And, and and it's hard, you know, <laughs> it's not easy. It, you know, again, hard just in the sense of finding the time to do it, paying the money, traveling there and getting a hotel, let alone the winning and stuff. You know, it's just hard to do it. And people don't get that. They, there's a lot of people who don't have titles or haven't gone as far as they could. I know lots of senior masters that, mm -hmm. that I'm friends with who I think could have made grandmaster, but they decided to become, you know, get a family and, and get yeah. a real job.
Yeah. You know, I shouldn't say real job. You know, I'm not. I think particularly nowadays you could do chess and, and it'll be a real job. But anyway, there's countless numbers. I know that because if you're 2400 and live where I live, you're not going to really get very far playing locally. You're not going to get to Grandmaster. You know, you're going to have to go to Norm tournaments. You're going to go this or I am whatever it is. So. So anyway, to go from 1900 to, if you're as talented enough to go from 1000 to 1900, which you sort of could do locally if you're living in the right areas, now you're going to have to probably start planning, you know, particularly as, as you go up more towards it, if you want to make FIDE Master or whatever, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, I mean, Candidate Master, I, I don't know what we're talking about FIDE, I mean, Candidate Master is only 100 points away, so, yeah. oh no, sorry, Candidate Master and FIDE, you got to get to 2200, what am I talking about? So, um... Yeah, it's it's not easy. You know? but probably, I mean, probably, if I'm not mistaken, the pace of uh, learning that shows from 1000 to 1900 can be one of the factors that can help with, let's say, reaching higher levels. Because the players showed, at least from my perspective, that he progressed very quickly with pretty much decent rating. Is it correct? Yeah, I mean, if you go from 1000 to 1900 in one year, mm-hmm. I mean, we're not talking online range, we're talking about over the board chess. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's really impressive. That's like... You know, I've read a lot about chess and stuff, and that's right up there with the most ch- impressive. You know, I mean, uh, you know, that that's not easy to do. I don't know how many people have ever done that, if if anyone. Mm-hmm. So if you're able to do that, then yeah, you probably, you know, you're so talented, you probably wouldn't have to put in much more work to get. But it is going to be harder. I mean, obviously, you know, 1900s, uh, you know, significantly weaker than 2200. Although, you know, particularly in this day and age, if they're active players, because as I said. Nowadays, everyone's dangerous, so it's um, to get to 2200 now is harder than it was, say, in the early 2000s. Um, you know, there's there's all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, problems, you, you know, in the rating system and otherwise that makes it very hard to do. Mm-hmm. So it's still not like um, necessarily a sure thing. But again, I'm kind of amazed by anyone and get go from 1000, like really go from 1000 to 1900 where they're like, you know, um, but you do see one thing I have to say when we say 1000, so it used to be a 1000 player. Let's say it's a 1000 rated adult. Mm-hmm. He started in chess, yeah. really started, and he's about 1000, right? Mm-hmm. That's very different than a 1000 rated kid who played in scholastic tournaments. Absolutely. You see what happens nowadays, you have all these scholastic tournaments, and you have a lot of kids with coaches who are playing online and doing chess all the time. Mm-hmm. And the scholastic tournaments are playing against each other. So. If you're playing against each other, you're all improving at the same rate. You, you know, not necessarily at the same rate. I shouldn't say that, but you're all improving, right? Mm-hmm. So there, and of course, young kids, classic kids, are likely to be improving a lot. And because you're mostly playing against each other, if you play in classic tournaments, you're, you're, you know, that's not shown because they're just playing against each other. This general improvement in the mm-hmm. pool of players. And then what happens is they go to an adult tournament, and they might be 1,000 rated from Scholastic Chess, which is actually in the U.S. is a pretty decent rating for mm-hmm. a scholastic chess player but then they go to the adult tournaments and now if you have a 1000 rated adult playing a 1000 rated kid the 1000 rated kid is going to probably kill him it's probably going to kill the adult because yeah. it's much harder <laughs> to get that 1000 rating scholastic chess mm-hmm. than it is at the adult level um so so if you're one of those 1000 rated kids and you go to 1900 in a year it's still impressive but it's not the same as being like sort of a 1000 rated adult level and go into 1900 in one year um if that makes sense mm-hmm. <laughs> you know but um yeah I, I don't know so i'm not sure what his question if his question is you know should he just stop playing i mean if you don't have time to put it into it but you're that talented that you made such progress and you're willing to go travel to tournaments and do all that stuff mm-hmm. i mean i don't know why you wouldn't study if you're gonna have to do all that but if you just don't want to study at all and just travel to tournaments and play in them and not look over your games and you're 1900, but you've improved so much in one year, then um, I think my bet would be that guy is so talented, he might be able to do it like Candidate Master or this mm-hmm. and that. Yeah, of yeah, course, yeah, if he yeah. actually puts in a little bit of work, he'd, he'd go even further. Mm-hmm. Of course, there are other, let's say, factors like investment, dedication, so on. Therefore, we yeah. understand it fully. And now we are just going into the topic because we just mentioned about the, let's say, uh, kids. Now we are going into a little bit children, and we know the children are signing up to schools, right? And at schools, there yeah. are more and more, let's say, chess clubs that are uh, set up in the chess school uh, system. And we are just talking about this one because this is especially important because as far as I know, 
uh, the recent years, chess boom in America is due mainly to growing chess club, right? Some like chess clubs in schools that are set up at the same time, the other clubs that were connecting to the system and therefore there's the boom and there are a lot of kids, uh, let's say, playing and the children from various groups are competing among the various uh, types of, uh, let's say, tournaments, various type of, let's say, leagues and so on. If you can get into the scholastic chess system and if you can get, get us the, the insight into this, how it works, how it is connected to and what's going about it, because this is especially important if you just understand like, how, how the players can improve with the help of scholastic chess. Okay, um, so you're saying explain the system and why the system's behind this classic boom? Yeah, something like uh, okay. how the system work and how much the system can work the children who are signed up into just just scholastic, let's say, instead of getting, let's say, the private tutors and so on. How, you mean how they can improve through scholastic chess? Yeah, yeah, how much they can improve, how much they can have support from the scholastic chess and so on, right? Okay, well, first off, um this this boom that we've had recently just this huge boom in chess not just scholastic i mean it's really astounding to me you know because again i've been with chess so long i know you have also and i you know i mean i think it's a great game you know for me it's no you know of course but um the way people just kind of caught on in the last year or two and now you have just these huge numbers getting the chess it's just like I gotta pinch myself. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, it's am amazing. You know, these classic tournaments and things like that have been around for a while. The only thing I could think of is, well, of course, COVID. Um, you know, people are at home. You know, so they couldn't go out and do sports to the kids maybe mm -hmm. as much. Um, so they had to find something. And then the online chess. You know, get chess.com. Li chess has uh, done such a great job um, making chess really fun. The YouTube videos, Gotham chess, people like that. Um, have been very helpful. I mean, I think that's the main reason behind the boom. I think those things, because this classic chess network has been around. Now, again, what I told you I discovered when I was a teenager, I think king, kids are starting to learn mm -hmm. that instead of going from video game to video game and mastering it, only to find out a few years later, no one really plays or, you know, it's just a kid's game. They, they now see they could play online, something that's very similar to a video game, you know, speed chess, bullet chess, whatever it is. And um, and then actually those skills they could then use to play in real life tournaments for you know things that colleges will recognize and you know and they could win trophies or money or whatever mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. So um, so I think that's that's really the big thing. Now of course the classic tournaments and the, the chess in schools have helps also. Um, but I don't think that's that's the reason for the recent boom because that's been around for a while. Um, but basically the way it works in the U.S. I think it's pretty similar everywhere. You have these uh, chess clubs in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, mostly what happens is you'll have a coach um, who will go over, uh, you know, positions or games, you know, generally in the beginning part of the class. Mm -hmm. And then they'll run a tournament, uh, like a school tournament, and the kids will play. And, um, and you'll do that for a set number of weeks or months. And then another session will start, and that's that's how it will work. And if he's a good coach, he'll get the kids to really enjoy. It. Now, one thing I think uh, some parents don't get with these classes mm -hmm. is they don't realize the difference between a private lesson and a chess class. Yeah. So they're two different things. They're both good. I'm not you know advocating for one or the other. Mm -hmm. But a chess coach in a typical school, you have people of all different levels. He's going to have the beginners come in not even knowing the rules. Mm -hmm. You're going to have you know, young Johnny who's starting to play in chess tournaments and is pretty good. Yeah. And he has to find a way to get them all interested and to, you know, pair up the right levels and to present. A lot of times you want to present material that everyone can get something from. So mm -hmm. if you go over, you know, say some famous chess game, you know, there will be some tough questions you'll ask that only Johnny will get who's playing in the tournament. But there will also be some little questions like, you know, what's a pin or where can this knight move that the more beginners will get. And you have to find that. And it's not always easy. You know, a good coach will be able to find that. And he'll, if he's a really good coach, he'll be able to make all the kids, uh, you know, really like chess, you know, or as many as possible. Mm -hmm. Even the beginners. The beginners won't feel like, you know, overwhelmed or, or shunned by the stronger players and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They create a welcoming environment. Then, of course, a private lesson is very different because then you're working one on one with whether it's a beginner or Johnny or whoever it is. Mm -hmm. And then you can really address their levels uh, precisely and and really, you know, work on stuff one on one with them and answer their questions and this and that. So it's a, it's a different sort of thing. Um, of course, coaching is much bigger now also than 
it was years ago. So that's, I guess, part of the scholastic chess movement. But in the United States, the way it works, and I think most other places, is um, once the kid outgrows the uh, school class chess tournament, if he does, mm -hmm. you know, there's normally some local scholastic tournaments going on, yeah. um, you know, and then they'll play a mat. And, um, you know, if their parents are they or, or hopefully both are interested, they can then move on to, um, you know, there's something called Continental Chess in the U.S., which has some, you know, sort of, uh, you know, open prizes and well, not to, there's there's by ratings, but you can win some pretty big prizes, even if you're just a kid, if, if you were actually able to win the section mm -hmm. and you'll be playing, that's more adult. So that would be kind of, and then uh, there's also um, all these national tournaments in, in the um, United States. The biggest one is the K for 12, mm -hmm. which generally has about 2,500 kids. Um, wow. And they have, they have a whole bunch of different, you know, type of big national events. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's like three or four in the U.S. And, uh, you know, that's a nice thing because you go there and you play and see kids from all over the country. Mm -hmm. so it's sort of very similar to local tournaments, but they're much bigger yeah. and they're kids from all over the country. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's a nice experience. Um, and then, you know, again, I mean, we all know, you know, if you, if you get really good at that, you might be selected to play in the world championships. Mm -hmm. um, and then, they, you know, you, you, they have all sorts of stuff you can do there. They do grade championships for the world championships. Yeah. So that's more or less how the network works. And, and as I said, it is kind of nice, you know, compared to, say, a video game where you, um, you know, these like a real events and they're real, you know, prestigious and, you know, it's, it's much different than... Um, you, you know, just some little local activity you might do. Or, you, you know, not that I have anything against video games. I mean, obviously there's some detractors, but I do think, I think kids realize what I realize that it's it's basically very similar, yet there's a lot more you can do with chess. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it's like beyond, you know, and, and we've reached that point. Chess.com so fun. I like chess. You have these YouTube videos you can share, you know, and learn from people on there. Um, it's also, by the way, you know, a big thing that we haven't mentioned you know, it used to be um, the advantages, you know, the kids who can afford high class coaches and, mm -hmm. and, and you know, particularly if they lived in Russia or something and they were going to these pioneer palaces. Because uh -huh. Russia had that where they'd identify talent. It was sort of like what I just described, but, you know, they had the pioneer palaces. Mm -hmm. So if you're yeah. Spassky, you're playing against local kids and then they say, hey, that Spassky kid's really, you know, impressive. And then they move you to a harder thing. Next thing you know, you're being trained by some super top coach. Um, so they have that there also, but um, but this is the thing today, and this is why Magnus Carlsen was able to get so good, you know, that we have a world cha or a former world champion from Norway, mm -hmm. we might have one from China. Um, nowadays, where you live, you can actually do quite a bit on your own. You know, it's 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 nice if you have the ability to have a coach and this and that. Mm -hmm. But you can, you know, between Stockfish, between YouTube and sites like that, between um you know, being able to play anyone, all different levels. Now, it is harder to get slow games against the strong players, but yeah, you can certainly yeah. play speed chess games. Um, you can go very, very far um, in chess without any coaching, without really any, much help at all, um, just using all the online stuff. Now, where a coach comes in is if you are spending the all this time, especially if you're putting in the work to become a really great player, like, you know, Grandmaster or whatever, uh, you know, it's nice to have a coach. You, you know, if I'm spending eight hours a week or whatever it is, you know, working on chess, you know, to have some guy who's who's been through it all, you know, give me some guidance over an hour, it's worth it. But at the same time, it's not essential. I think if someone's really determined, they work really hard. Um, I know Hikaro early on, he was coached by a GM and he, um, this was when he was a young child before he was really that well known. And the GM gave him homework and stuff. I remember Hikaro's dad yeah. is a top chess coach, yeah. you know, he, up just goes so and his dad um he found a, a very well respected gm to teach him and the carol just <laughs> he i think the story is that he tossed the homework back of the kit throw it away if i'm not mistaken right <laughs> yeah you heard the story right yeah mm -hmm. he just crumpled it up tossed it at him the, the coach went into read tarish's book uh 300 games of chess and the carol hated it and um a carol you know according to a carol and, and i believe him did uh you know did all this work on his own mostly i mean of course he had a dad who was a very strong player but at a certain point you know it was all hikaro um so uh you know it depends and i know um i do remember 
I worked at a camp that uh, Hikaru's dad, Sunil, helped start. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to Sunil. Sunil would visit the camp. And um, this was when Hikaru was very little, maybe five. I, I don't know. Or maybe a little bit older. Not much. But he wasn't He wasn't that well known. And I said, oh, it's Hikaru's birthday. What, what, what are you getting him? Or he's planning on getting a gift for Hikaru. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, I'm going to get him the latest engine. Like he was getting him the latest computer engine, yeah. and and Caro and his brother Asuka, who were also who's also a good player, um, they would copy uh, the informants into their laptop, you know, by hand, like each chapter. Mm -hmm. That was way before you know Caro went anywhere. Yeah, you know, was known by anyone really, other than local people. So um, you know, he did his own thing, but um, there's various ways to get there. But the nice thing is, if you really do have the talent, mm -hmm. and if you want to maximize the talent, whether yeah. You're Magnus Carlsen or Brian Karen or Thomas, it's there, you know, and there's no secret, you mm -hmm. know, just challenge yourself, learn from your mistakes, you know, and there's millions of ways to do that with all these online things. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing that all the time, like really challenge, like I just looked at, I was looking at this end game um, study in Thomas Enquist's book, uh, 300 Most Important Chess Positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's like this by Grigoryov, I forget, Grigoryov, how do you pronounce his name? Grigoryov, probably. Um, yeah, and it's really tough. You know, I looked at it even, even you know, I looked at it for a while, and mm -hmm. it was very tough. The the thing that I thought was the solution wasn't the solution. And it's just a king and pawn in game, you yeah, know, right? Yeah, of course, we know they can be very complicated. And um, and then I this was just this morning, and then I looked over the solution, mm -hmm. and I sort of get it at this point, but I really don't. So I'm gonna have to look over it some more. But I think if if someone wants to maximize their talent. That's what they have to do, and they have to do that a lot more than I do it. You know, just constantly looking at tough problems, mm -hmm. constantly analyzing their games by themselves, them with the computer. Just any chance, any way they can think of to challenge themselves and then learn from it using computer resources or coaches or whatever. Um, if they just keep doing that, they'll maximize their talent. There's no secret. The, mm -hmm. the secret is that no one really wants to do it. You know? yeah. and, I mean, you know, this is the you know, secret. So you, know, as as you, you know, that's the secret. I know I could I could get months better and uh, everyone could, but they have to be willing to do that. Now that's where chess, um, you know, being like a professional chess playing for like winning tournaments and maximizing your talent, or just enjoying chess and entertainment to a certain extent part ways. Because I love chess and I enjoy it, and I'll probably go over that Grigab student, but I wouldn't do that all the time because I'm not so concerned about maximizing my talent as I am and just learning, enjoying the game, um, and you know, for that case, you don't have to necessarily push yourself as much. Mm -hmm. But the ones who are determined to go from 1900 to, you know, Grandmaster or whatever it is, you got to do that, and you got to do a lot of it. And uh, even without a coach, you could probably do it. It's a little bit easier if you have a coach. But um, if you have, and, and again, some people just aren't going to have the talent. You know, I mean, you can see talent does exist. Some people say, oh, yeah. talent doesn't exist, and it's a nice thing to say, but. I definitely see it in myself. I mm -hmm. see it in the, the players that I know, which are of all different abilities. I see it in the kids I first teach us. There are some kids, like talking about five-year-olds, there are some five-year-olds I'll show the ladder mate to, very clear at it, you know, I've been teaching it for years, and they just have a lot of trouble getting it. Like, you just you're like, I just showed you, you move this rope, and you move that rope. And of course, as a coach, you have to, you know, not get frustrated and just smile, but, you know, like, how are you not getting this? We just look at this. And, um, then there's other kids you show it to them once or twice, and all of a sudden they're checkmating with the ladder mate, and and that's talent, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another thing that you'll see with precocious kids. This is a good way to tell how far a kid will go. I, I mean, not, it's obviously not an exact way to find it, but or at least how serious he is. Remember, I told you about the talented kid yeah. who once he starts losing is going to quit chess and yeah. he doesn't get yeah, it. Yeah, I read it. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whereas you might have a talented player who really pushes through. Yeah. Here's the way to tell ahead of time which which is which. Mm-hmm show chess notation to a kid and how to keep chess notation mm -hmm. if the kid immediately understands why this is necessary and immediately wants to do it um then he's probably talented or whatever you want to call it he's probably going to push himself even when he reaches those roadblocks the kids who hate to now now i should say most kids do hate to do it so i shouldn't say it automatically means they're gonna, not going to go anywhere mm -hmm. but i will tell you the kid who immediately recognizes the importance of it and wants to do it 
you know that kid's gonna go far. Yeah, you know? yeah, very good point. And by the way, uh, it is that because in the chat we are just in the meantime just talking about the stuff that you are, let's say, referring to. And there is one comment that I would like to address just briefly. That is the confirmation that you just, uh, just just mentioned. Our friend Grasshopper mentions that it's about the love, and he says, "I knew a yes. national master who played a 15 round robin of five minutes blitz, won all the games, and wrote them all down afterwards." I said, how could you possibly do that? And he said, it means that much to me, right? And this is the exactly. dedication exactly. and this is like a passion, but in the same time, making all of the challenges and trying to get as far as possible without looking of the obstacles, but trying to get that far as possible, right? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. If, if you love it and, and, you need, and again, this is where a good coach might come in handy, especially for kids who, aren't, who, who can't think like adults, mm -hmm. to find a way to teach them to love that, to love yeah, the challenge. Yeah. To love loves, working okay. at chess at the same time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, I, I once uh, I went to a simul, got a Kamsky give, and we ate dinner afterwards, me and a bunch of people with him. And he mentioned when he was a kid coming up, he would play all these blitz games against, mm -hmm. you know, the, the people at his club. And he would go home and he'd write them all down by hand. Mm -hmm. Every game. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Now, of course, you, you have it on the service. So that's a big advantage, mm -hmm. you know? It's, uh, uh, you know, that's a big change in chess that didn't exist. People don't mention that enough. So if you lived in Capablanca's time or, or even Fisher's, right? You know, the Blitz play then, they play Blitz. I mean, some of the games they can recreate, especially if they're Fisher or Capablanca. But for the most part, you know, they're playing hundreds of Blitz games. You know, they can't look them over with a computer. Output. Nowadays, you're able to play your games and look them over. So that, that changes. So whereas they used to say Blitz chess was bad, I think now we see all the top players are playing Blitz chess. And it's because of that. It's because mm -hmm. they can actually, they have all these hundreds of games, thousands of games they've played, and they can look them all over with a computer, uh, you know, or if they're good enough, just figure it out. Um, but um, Fisher, Capablanca, when they played Blitz back then, you know, they didn't have that ability. So mm -hmm. it totally changed how helpful Blitz may be. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And uh, I guess that it's very important because this way, if we can see this from the bigger picture, if I can say that, if we get some of the elements like talents, ability to learn, ability to draw conclusions, ability to manage the stress and all of the parts, it is some like more likelihood that you're getting way farther when the people, they mo may not have it, right? For the people, exactly. for example, exactly. if they are not having the uh, good nervous system and they are re reacting too much uh, disproportionately uh, related to the stimuli, they would, for, for example, hate losing. And losing is the part of getting better, right? And if the people Absolutely. who are losing pretty much, uh, sorry, cannot deal with losses, even if they are yeah. pretty talented, they, they may just stuck at, let's say, candidate master level, right? No matter what they yes. do, because they will be all of the time some kind of tilted whenever they lose the games. And next game, they will be losing, let's say, badly because of the previous one that made them tilted, right? Exactly. Yeah, you see that. I mean, I know Arthur Yosipov, a very well-respected grandmaster, a great mm -hmm. player one of the greatest games of all time something happened i don't remember the details exactly but his uh laptop or notebook was stolen like mm -hmm. after he beat ivan chuck yeah um you know right around that time he played this great game against ivan chuck i think he beat them in the match him in the match mm -hmm. and joseph was very close to number three in the world yeah if not he might have even been number three of course one and two were casper and carpo back then but um so you're we like okay you know this is going to be the era of Yosipov. And um, after he had that robbery, um, they, they took his notebook. I mean, I don't know the exact details. People could look it up. But um, his career was never the same. He never, mm -hmm. you know, that was it. it was never recovered. Not, never recovered. I guess it affected his nervous system or something. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, little things like that. And there's another, there's a funny story about Ivan Chuck. Um, I don't know if it's true or not. It might be. Mm -hmm. But um, Boris Pasky saw Ivan Chuck very early on in, his, in Ivan Chuck's career. Mm -hmm. Spassky was amazed by Ivan Chuck's talent and he said this guy can become world champion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you hear the story? Yeah. And then he and Ivan Chuck go to dinner, go to a dinner, and when they open the door uh to the dinner, this big dog in the house like jumps on them or something and barks at them. Mm -hmm. And they both were startled. But then Spassky noticed that for the rest of the dinner, Ivan Chuck's shaking, you know, his, yeah. like he was totally upset by this dog for the whole dinner. Mm -hmm. And Spassky says, so at that point, I realized he wouldn't be world champion because he didn't have the nervous system. So. Yeah. And it is true what, what you said, like, there's so many other, like a lot of people think, again, if you're to be good at chess, you just have to be good at chess. There's so many things like nervous system, you know, visualization ability, health, 
Um, you, you know, there's a lot of things that aren't necessarily related to uh, chess knowledge, mm -hmm. which is also funny. As someone who's studied chess, you know, the one thing you can get good at chess at, whether you have a ability or not, is knowing chess history. Yeah. And, and I've studied tons of it. I suspect you did also. So, uh, you know, it's no secret. I know a lot about chess history because I read a zillion books on it and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I do sometimes get people who will be like, well, this grandmaster, he said this, and, and I don't care what you say because the grandmaster knows more because he's a grandmaster. Meanwhile, you know, and, and there's a lot of grandmasters who admit this, there's a lot of grandmasters who know, like, nothing about it. Like, they haven't studied chess history at all. They're they're interested in improvement. They're interested in doing endgame studies or, or whatever they do. Mm -hmm. But um, they know very little, you know, and, and um, you know, because, again, you, just because someone, um, there, there's more to chess strength and especially chess knowledge than necessarily performance. I mean, mm -hmm. Obviously, in the end, you know, Grandmaster is a great player and yeah. they're going to perform better than anyone else, you know, than people who are weaker. But it doesn't mean that they know chess history automatically. You know, they might, they might not. It doesn't mean they're necessarily a good teacher. There's Grandmasters who are great chess coaches. There's Grandmasters who I wouldn't let a kid near, you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing that happens a lot. Now, you'll have a kid who, like, doesn't know ladder made, a beginner kid, and, and you'll have some parents who are like, I'm going to spend like $200 an hour to get this grandmaster to teach him because my kid can yeah. only be taught by About and the rate, grandmaster. Right? <laughs> yeah, and the grandmaster might be terrible. He might be like, you know, yelling at the kid or mm -hmm. like, you know, he might be totally unsuited for teaching because he's able to teach because he has a grandmaster. Now, of course, that's not all grandmasters. There's some grandmasters who are great coaches. Um, but guess what, though? Also, to teach that kid the ladder mate, you're going to pay this great coach um, a lot more money because chances are if you're a grandmaster and a great coach, you could charge, you know, two hundred dollars an hour more, or whatever, because you have them both, you know. So, you know, just uh, people have to take things like that into account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And one anecdote quickly that comes to mind that you just mentioned about this uh, latest episode about the grandmaster reeling at the kid and the history, especially the history that you provided that some players may not know history at all and they can become very strong players, right? Because of the analysis of yeah. the game playing strength and so on. There was one funny anecdote. It is probably the anecdote can be shared in all of the countries, but it was especially in my country because I heard from one of the chess players or maybe, maybe even chess instructors. And it says like that. Uh, the coach is asking the uh, pupil, the pretty much, let's say, talented one, and it was probably the girl, let's say, age uh, 11 or 12, why do, why aren't you, let's say, willing to study Nimzovic? And he was just answering uh, this with a smile on her face. He said, Nimzovic is dead. I'm not going to play him anymore. <laughs> that's great that's a great story right and this is some like a pretty pretty straight argument why some uh, yes. let's say players are not know not knowing about uh, about chess history at all right because they are practical players and if they do not face the player that they are going to play against they are not studying via let's say uh, heritage and via creativity right absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. Okay, let's go for the next part because we are just having a few more and we are going uh, close, uh, closer and closer into the stuff that probably is very important nowadays, especially after the COVID uh, stuff is over. We are just having more open spaces and the people are going into the chess clubs. And chess clubs are b booming, uh, becoming more more popular. There is some boom, if I can say that. And in the meantime, yes. we want to know about chess clubs, practically speaking, the same or pretty similar about the scholastic chess, especially how difficult it is to run the club, manage the club, and what is going on about the clubs that people are going more and more, even though they have the opponents 24 hours a day that uh, all of the servers like Chesco, Mitches, and so on. Why people want to play uh, over the board and why they go into the chess clubs? Okay, I mean, there's a very good, I, I keep going back to this uh, thing. Um, when you play online, so I do get some people nowadays, I, I'm noticing, you know, I'll ask someone how strong they are, this or that, and they'll say, oh, I'm, I'm 1800 rated or, you know, this or that. And I'll find out, you know, it used to be if you said that it meant your national rating or your FIDE rating. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, a lot of people will say that and it'll be like their chess.com rating or something. You know, you'll be like, I don't, you know, people like me and probably you, you we don't consider those real ratings, you know, yeah. because the, the thing is with chess.com or, or LI chess, I mean, they're fine and, and I guess the rating has some meaning, but really not because we're playing under unequal conditions. So when I play, you know, I might be private in a room, you know, totally focused. I might be playing someone who has like five kids running around screaming at them. You know, it's like, it's different environments. We're not in equal environments. Obviously you have the, the computer cheating, which also comes a, a, into play. Someone mm -hmm. might be cheating, that affects the ratings too. Um, 
So you can never take the online reading so seriously. Also online, you're more likely to play mostly quick time controls because even if the player plays a slow time control, you don't know that they're going to approach it with the seriousness that they would in an over the board club. Mm -hmm. So if I play a slow time control on here, I might be playing it while I'm eating, you know, making dinner or, you know, doing other stuff because, you know, it's just some online game. It doesn't really matter. Um, but over the board, you know, someone's been serious enough to come there, you know, drive wherever it is and go to the club. They're sitting right across from you. Equal conditions. Obviously, we're hoping no one's cheating. You know, it's much mm -hmm. harder to do with the board. Um, and so those ratings are just going to be much more important. So again, if you're someone who plays online a lot and, and you say, gee, I want to, you know, I'm doing so much chess online. Let me go take it to the next level. And again, this is what I think chess has over video games or other things that you could play this you know computer video game and then all of a sudden take it into the real world you know mm -hmm. and be like i'm playing call of duty you know running around for the rifle and then and taking the real world of course yeah. they're a lot more dangerous um but um in any case you know so you go to the club and and i think that's why again sites like chess.com and all that that to me is the biggest change that how good these sites have gotten how good the videos have gotten on youtube and places like that that to me because is the biggest change I've seen in the last like five to ten years as chess has been rapidly becoming more popular. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's the Scholastic um, setup. I mean, the Scholastic setup was there and, and it's helpful, but I don't think it was the catalyst. And as far as the over the board play, again, I don't think it's a catalyst. But but there there's sort of a network that exists, mm -hmm. so that's where it's helpful. So now that people are discovering chess on sites like Chess.com and Li Chess and, mm -hmm. and for YouTube videos. Um, now, because we have that whole network of classic chess and over the board clubs, adult clubs, that's where it helps. As far as that's hard to manage, well, I mean, there's a few things when you're managing. Of course, I don't run an adult club, um, but I have been, you know, involved in them and, and stuff. Um, I mostly run school, you know, programs, but mm -hmm. I know all about adult clubs, having played there quite a bit. Um, you know, I think one thing is, first of all, What's really funny is I get a lot of people uh, I see at these clubs who criticize the people who run them. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. some people, they like whisper, I think he's making money, mm -hmm. you know, something mm -hmm. like that. And, and it's sort of like the guys out let's there. De he's, let's debust de de this myth, right? Yeah, like, I mean, if he's making money, more power to him, you know, because to run a club, I think what's what's hard is one, you have to take that, that time. Like you're committed for, you mm -hmm. know, however it's long. It's a normal job, right? Yeah, it's at least six hours a week or something, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I know one person, uh, Neil Bellin, runs the Chess Angle podcast. Mm -hmm. He has to get yeah, up early the next night. morning for school. Yeah, he has to, he's a teacher. He has to get up early for school the next morning. He has a child and, you know, and, and he's working till, uh, you know, uh, he's at the club managing it till late at night, you know, because that's what he wants to do. Uh, one thing about Neil also I'll mention. He would complain about another local tournament director, right? Mm -hmm. But then Neil did something that other people don't do. Neil said, okay, you know, I don't like the way this guy's doing certain things. Yeah. So I'm going to go out. He found his own site. He mm -hmm. built his own club. And he does it the way he wants to do it. Yeah. And that's fine. More often than not, the people complain. Like, that's all they're doing. They're just complaining. I, um, I, I mean, just uh, on a tangent, you know, I run that um, FIDE World Champion 2023 group on Facebook. And you, you see how I, you're on it, right? I, I'm posting on it all the time. Now, the way that thing works, I've always followed chess closely. I'm always reading everything I can on it. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big chess fan, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason I started Chess Book Collectors Group and the Facebook group, uh, the FIDE World Championship 2023, mm -hmm. is as long as I'm doing all this stuff, hey, you know, I can go on Facebook and share it, you know, and other people, I'll, I'll find people like you who, who love chess too, and we can discuss it. Mm -hmm. And I say, why not? But it's not a big thing to me. Like, like if, if they both disappeared tomorrow, yeah. it, I wouldn't like it. You know, I mean, they're nice and they're they're useful. But, um, you know, it, it really wouldn't change much. I'd still be following chess really closely and reading chess books and doing all that. And it's not like I make money from them, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so it's not that big of a thing to me. I'm just like, okay, you know, like the Phoenix World Champions. I'll see a, a Twitter thing or something where someone says something that I find interesting about the world championship and then I'll post it to my group and you know other people will post and the things I think are interesting I'll, I'll do it you know and so so that's all those groups are but one day um and this doesn't happen a lot 
But you get uh, this guy comes on and accuses me because I've put up one post where I didn't mention it was from Wikipedia. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, a, I almost always mention where the posts are yeah, from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just credit the source. Mm-hmm. But one time it was something like a regulations for the 2021 match, mm-hmm. and I think I forgot to mention it was from Wikipedia. But yeah. it was pretty obvious to anyone. Yeah. Who, you know, and it's just the rules of the match. It's not like someone wrote a poem. Of course, or it's not creative approach, and this, right? Yeah, and this guy who I can see, you know, from his uh, being an admin never posted anything, never commented anything, has some long stuff accusing me of being a plagiarist and all sorts of like he's furious that mm-hmm. I put up this Wikipedia thing without mentioning it. Um, so anyway, getting back to the, the adult clubs, you you know, people who run that sometimes get this sort of thing where people are like hypercritical of them mm-hmm. um, and they're running the club. And, and the way I am, I'm like, <laughs> you know, you got to play story. Remember I told you my story where I couldn't get a rating for a number of years because the guy got in a fight with the, the State Chess Association. Um, incidentally, uh, on this topic also, so this guy, Mark Thompson, I don't even know if he's still alive. He um, he ran this club for many years in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. And, uh, you know, whatever his faults, you know, where he couldn't get a rating or something, he came down every week, he, he, he ran the tournaments, he did what he had to do, and the club existed. Mm-hmm. Then all of a sudden, a younger person, uh, you know, came from a good school, smart guy, this and that, said, hey, you know, I mean, I guess part of it was that Mark wasn't running any tournaments, but whatever it was, he said, hey, you know, I want to take over, Mark's not doing a good job, this and that. Mm -hmm. And I took over the club, and um, I guess I I had moved at that point, but I, you know, I still had friends in there, and I guess he did a good job for one or two years after that, but then he left. And you didn't have any Mark Thompson there anymore, you know? So you got to appreciate these guys. They're taking time out of their yeah, week. Appreciation. They're spending a lot of time. And sure, you know, they do something wrong. You, you might have to complain, but, you, you know, do it in a way where you're taking into account how much work they're doing. I don't think there's a ton of work involved. You have to know the rules. You have to be able to handle disputes tactfully. Um, you know, you got to do your advertising. You got to find a site, um, pay the bills for the site, collect the dues. You know, there's a lot of little things you got to do, and um, but uh, you know, I mean, it's very doable. But the main thing is, you're doing it either not making money or making very little money, mm-hmm. but you're providing that service. You know, and yeah. so I think it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, uh, very, very, very important what you just said because people are sometimes uh, a little bit too much. Uh... I would say jealous that if you are just doing something important, let's say running the chess mm-hmm. club, a little bit of prestigious, at least nowadays, you need to, uh, let's say, uh, earn a lot of money, right? Because they are just something like having, oh, if yeah. every player just pay, let's say, $100 uh, dollars for fee, they, they, they will just take all of the fee, right? If there is another, let's say, uh, fees, they will get everything, but they do not think that these fees are going into the price found, into the another, let's say, additional expenses and so on. They are something like that they are thinking that all of this is taken by the white person who is running the club, let's say the CEO or some like tournament director or any, any like that, right? But they do not see the expenses that must be covered, but all of these other activities, right? Exactly. And that's what I see a lot of time. And by the way, if someone makes money, mm-hmm. you know, I don't, I'm totally fine with someone making money off for chess. You know, they're able to run a club and they charge money. The main thing I'm concerned about is I'm going to play in a tournament. I look at how much it costs to enter. If I can afford it, I play in it. You know, if it's, if it's you know, if I think it's, it's, I mean, obviously I'll be able to afford it, but if I think if it's too expensive, I might not play in it, you know, but, um, Listen, you know, if the guy's able to, to run a tournament and have a fee that I don't think is outrageous mm-hmm. and he's making money, that's actually very good because if they're a volunteer, you can only expect the volunteer to go so far in, in serving you mm-hmm. and helping you. You know, they're a volunteer, uh, you know, a professional. And, and by the way, I should mention volunteers can sometimes make it impossible for professionals. So mm-hmm. it could be a bad thing sometimes when someone volunteers. So if you have someone volunteer, run a club and it's like kind of crappy club and he doesn't really mm-hmm. you know he skips meetings or he does whatever you know whereas you know you have another guy who would be a professional and and he might earn a little bit of money but he's mm-hmm. gonna treat it like a real job you know it might be worth that the guy's making money you know it's uh what what the heck you know yeah. chess players can be very cheap when it comes to spending for chess you know <laughs> if, if you look at what people like who, who like golf or something like that you know they'll spend all sort of money without thinking about it but chess players, sometimes it's like a crime if you're making money off of chess. So. Mm-hmm. It seems like you know, a crime. It's ridiculous, by the way. Yeah, if they're mm-hmm. able to do it, why not, right? 
yeah, of course, it is a normal job and uh, people who are not, uh, let's say, into this, uh, let's say, activities, they do not know that this is the same job as you are going in an office, in any company. Yeah. It is some like the responsibilities for some of the actions, right? Providing all of the equipment, providing all of the conditions, providing all of the, let's say, tournament directors, providing all of the boards, the clocks, all of the information, yeah. signing up the players, a lot of the activities, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's basically what it goes into running a chess club nowadays. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. We just get into the chess clubs because it was very important stuff due to, let's say, uh, emerging the people who are just popping up into the chess club because they are super, super curious. And uh, we are just talking uh, some uh, at some point you just mentioned many times, but I will just get a little bit more into this topic about social groups online, especially the groups that you are managing and a little bit insight uh, from your standpoint as an administrator and about the people. Who are they? What are the, what are the groups? And how the people behave? how do people support each other and if you just give us a little bit of insight yeah, it will be okay. even more so the first group i started was actually a page a classic chess page and you know as i said i'm always reading about the stuff so i'd post about it um but it wasn't really because it wasn't a group there wasn't much interaction and you know eventually i, I just I, I, it still exists uh, i think if you type classic chess in facebook it comes up but i, I haven't really been keeping it up to date or, for years now um, cause it just wasn't getting much attention or, you know, you know, it just, uh, I didn't see the point of it at a certain point, but, um, the, the main thing is, uh, you know, as I said, one, one day, I think it was during the NBA finals on a commercial break. I said, gee, you know, I, I have a lot of chess books or chess books. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be nice to have a group, right? So I literally started on a commercial and my expectation would be, I'd have a couple of my friends. I think I sent invites to my Facebook friends who are into chess books. Yeah. But some of my friends, they might invite a few people. And I thought it might be like 15 to 20 people and we talk about chess books. And honestly, if that's all it was, I would have been totally happy. And I don't think my life would be that different than it is right now. Mm -hmm. you, you know, it wouldn't be. Um, but of course, as you know, as a member, it just very quickly grew. Now I think it's something at 45,000 or 47,000 yeah. people and people talk about it and stuff. And of course, I'm not, you know, I mean, just like you like it, I like it, you know, in other words, it's not that big a, a thing correction. Sorry, my friend, a correction. I don't like the group. I love the group. Sorry yeah, about it. Here. I needed same to do it. I don't yeah, like so... it. I love it. Sorry. <laughs> and so does a lot of different people. And, and I do too. So I shouldn't say like if it disappeared, it wouldn't really bother me. Yeah. But it's more from the perspective of you. Like I don't get much more out of it than you do. You know, I'm a member mm -hmm. and I like chess books, so I love the group. But, um, but that's it. Uh, now, basically, I would say um, what I did when I did this group and the FIDE World Championship group mm -hmm. is um, I'm just my own sensor. You know, basically, I'm coming at it. You know, you know, Steve Jobs used to have this thing, you know, when he ran Apple, he'd yeah. be like, well, the consumer doesn't know. I know what the consumer wants more than he does. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't want to say that, but I will say that basically, um, you, you know, I would just, you, you know, like, if, okay, when I started the group, I remember early on, some guy was posting YouTube videos of windmill mm -hmm. sets. Places, you know, like, yeah. like this, and I'm like, as a chess book coach, because I didn't come here to watch a YouTube video on windmill sacrifices. Yeah, of course. So very quickly, you know, I'm like, I don't want extraneous stuff. If you come, if you come on Facebook, like, if I come on Facebook, I, I go to YouTube a lot. Also, I go to YouTube when I want to watch videos. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can very easily search chess books or whatever I want on YouTube and watch all the videos I want. When I go to Facebook, and particularly if I go to a group, chess book collectors. I want posts about chess book collecting. So that was the first thing. I made sure I was very consistent with that. Obviously, any, you know, insulting things like that, you can't allow. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I just mostly, you know, just just made sure, you know, I was enjoying it. There was some, generally I felt like if there's some member who's taking everyone off or doing something wrong, probably if I'm noticing it, other people are noticing it. Mm -hmm. If there's some content that really doesn't seem like it belongs there, generally if I notice it, I think other people, because I'm a big chess fan and so are people like you who are mostly the members. Now, the chess book collectors group actually is just very easy to run. I have help from Neil Sullivan, um, but for the most part, you know, the people who like chess books, I think are good people. Mm -hmm. You know, because think of it, who out there, first of all, a lot of people don't even read today, nowadays, let alone chess books. Oh. So if you're someone, and again, because nowadays you can get so good at chess not even reading chess books, mm -hmm. you know, the type of people who like chess books are probably really invested in chess yeah. and generally thoughtful people. Mm -hmm. So the group is just so easy to run. 
Now I have two other groups. So I have the speed chess group, mm -hmm. which I thought would be like, you know, as big or bigger than any of them because everyone's playing speed chess, right? And I thought it'd be a place to share your games mm -hmm. and things like that. That group, I think we have 10,000 members, but it's never really done that well. I, I mostly just post the stuff that I see about speed chess in it, but I think the people who are likely to join the speed chess group are not the type of people who are going to be very interested in contributing to a group, or at least they don't want to talk about speed chess. They just, that's what they do. They, they play one. I'm, I'm one of the people I want to talk to. I'm an outsider. I play a lot of bullet chess and speed chess, but um, I thought they'd want to share their games and talk about it doesn't seem to be the case. We only have about 9,000 members and they're not very active. Mm -hmm. Now the CDA World Championship group, 2000, it started out 2018. I've been updating it each year. Now it's CDA World Championship 2023. Mm -hmm. Originally I tried to run that group like I run the chess book collectors group and anyone could post and you know, if there's something out of line, I could take it down. But very quickly I realized cause it's like more of a public group and there's a wider type of person who might join it. Mm -hmm sudden we're inundated with like ridiculous troll posts pornographic uh, you know yeah. just forbidden, horrible, forbidden horrible, content mm -hmm. yeah horrible or, or even stuff that it, they might not be trying to post something you know um profane or something but just like inane posts like what what are you talking about you know mm -hmm. right um you know um so uh so at a certain point i had to make it where i have to approve the posts mm -hmm. yeah. and since then the memberships went way up because now what happens I, I mostly approve anything that's not a YouTube video. Mm -hmm. And even if I don't agree with it, you know, if I think it's something that, you know, someone who's a member is interested in posting and it's not completely off topic, mm -hmm. I'll post it, you know, even though I might not be interested in that post. Yeah. But if it's not off topic, it's something that has to do with the World Championship. And by the way, the group, I did kind of bend the rules with that group compared to the Chess Book Collectors group. I've kind of let people talk about things that are not necessarily the world championship but mm -hmm. there's sort of things that you know a serious you know a chess fan is going to be interested in so you know but so it does kind of stray from the topic a little bit but um but yeah i mean i think you know i've earned uh, i've earned my badge as a real chess fan and i think other real chess fans can see generally if i like it they probably like it and so i approve that stuff and again, that one, you know, I never would have predicted, you know, now it's at 84,000 and it keeps growing. We'll probably hit 100,000 somewhere. And I don't think I'm doing that much. I don't want to make it sound like I'm some genius. You know, again, I keep the, I keep really irrelevant content out there. I keep the, so when someone comes on, just like I like, and by the way, I go to other groups that I don't run, obviously. I'm into boxing and some other thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I go to some groups and there, there's two types of bad groups on Facebook. One, they're not really updated or, or you, you get the feeling there's not even an admin on it, you know, because you get all these childish arguments and no one's doing anything mm -hmm. and they're not updated. And, you know, so obviously that's a dead group. And then you get other groups that do stuff like that, where I'll go into say a boxing group and there's some YouTube video about nonsense or, you know, there's silly posts that have nothing to do with the, the group topic. Um, and so I don't like it. So, so basically what it is, I created, made sure that my groups weren't like that mm -hmm. and it, you know, it shows people appreciate it because, again, the groups have grown far more than I ever expected. You know, of all the things I've done in chess, both as a player, a coach, you know, I told you about my internet background, yeah. all this other stuff. I say the thing I'm most known for probably at this point are these groups. And, you know, I don't do that much more than say you, you, you know, I'll, I'll go to the groups, I'll read it. You know, I, I do have a little bit more power in what comes on it. But for the most part, you know, it's just uh, they happen to be there, and then every once in a while I look up and I go, "Oh, we're at eighty-four thousand now." Mm -hmm. yeah. And you are doing know. fantastic work, by the way. I, I'm public to want to thank you very much for running this group, especially just book collectors, not just this yes. one, but especially this one, because this this group is one of the best thing I have ever m met with the relationship about the books, about the content, about uh, let's say providing the suggestions about what is the book for the kids, for the improving player, yeah, for the end game. It's absolutely. Brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, and I'm very and serious again, about it. And again, it's because of the members. I mean, members like you and, and everyone else. I, I think in terms of chess IQ, it's probably the highest. Yeah. Because as we said, just because someone's a grandmaster, it doesn't mean they know a lot about it. They might, they, they might not. Mm -hmm. But um, the people who are likely to be active members in this group are people. By the way, this is one other thing. I mentioned this in some other podcasts that I do that I noticed. When someone's a playing in the area, now, even if they're not a great player, mm -hmm. like a lot of people know me in New York, especially when I would play a lot over the board, um, to the extent they'd play a lot. Um, you know, I got to meet all the other over the board players and like, oh, that's Brian Cameron, you know, at the NASA Chess, you know, we had a bunch of people. So, so if you play over the board, 
you're going to be noticed, especially if you get strong. But even if you don't get strong, you're going to know a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I've noticed there's a lot of people in the chess book collectors group who know a tremendous amount of chess. Like their chess IQ is very high, um, but they've played very rarely or, or not much at all. They, many of them didn't achieve any sort of you know significant chess rating, but they know a lot about chess. And that's because they're mostly studying chess for entertainment. And when, when you read a book, when you read Nimzovich's book or something like that, no one knows it other than you, unless you go out of their, your way to tell them. So you can read all these books as the people in our groups do, and they're learning more and more about chess. But since they're not playing in tournaments, it's not reflected. No one necessarily meets them or something. So when I, when I created this group, there were all sorts of people. I'm like, wow, that guy knows a lot about chess. And it's someone who probably, you know, no one would really know knows much about chess, uh, you know, if it wasn't for that group, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think the chess IQ is very high in that group. And it's kind of given an outlet to people who know a lot about chess, even if they um, are not necessarily over the board players or, or, or don't do it much. Mm hmm. Yeah, and this group is amazing, as I just mentioned many, many times. I'm so happy because due to this group, I'm not sure if I could should announce it publicly, but I'm becoming more and more addicted to books. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it does have that. Uh... Yeah, because many times maybe I'll just reveal a little bit of secret. Maybe somebody would like to join our group as well. It is not like that uh, we are some like that much obsessed in a positive way about the books that at some point some some of the collectors are just sharing that I have bought this group. Uh, sorry, bought uh, these books or I just received these books and it's not like that. Okay, I'm putting into the list. In the next month, I'll be posting mine. Right? <laughs> yes, I never realized there were so many people like me who do this. You uh -huh. know, until I heard the group yeah no one, if they didn't play over the board and people didn't get no, to know them as many of the people in our group don't no one would know people like this exist. yeah like, yeah i don't run around telling people i buy chess books all the time you know but uh, mm -hmm. uh unless they're members of the chess book collectors group yeah. you know so i remember um a senior master telling me he uh he joked uh, a while ago this is years ago he goes a person the size of a person's chess book collection is inversely proportional to their strength oh <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, we have the inside joke, if I can say that, or a little bit of trolling in a positive way, that if anybody says that he started reading the book or the books, we are just threatening him to expel from the group because we are not read readers, but we are just collectors, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, that's the joke. Therefore, it's a great yeah. joke, right? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, what I like doing, you know, I'll, I, I don't necessarily read the books. I mean, I do know there's, I've had friends who, in many cases, strong players, who are very, you know, they'll get a book and that's it. They, they don't read any of the books till they finish it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, I like having a lot of books and skimming through different ones. Yeah, I mean, I use them. You know, I do, like I told you, I was going for that Grugiav position from the um, 300 Most Important Positions by mm -hmm. Thomas Engels. I don't know that I'm going to actually finish that book. But, you know, the amount of time I'm spending on it the last week or something, uh, you know, certainly for entertainment, I'm getting it. And, and you know, if I was a young up and coming player, I'd probably be improving a lot from it too. Um, you know, so even though I don't finish the book, you know, I read it to completion, I, I've definitely gotten my money's worth from it, you know. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you go to see a movie, you know, it's or rent a movie, it's although the books sometimes are getting expensive. I do mostly electronic books now, so yeah, yeah, cheaper. and that's why I will, I'd like to translate it into because we are just talking about chess book collectors, and now it's the natural part that we'll need to talk about chess books. Especially oh, sure. because chess books are just making the, I would say, transition from the, let's say, the tra traditional part of the paper books into the electronic one and something like in between, oh. for example, the interactive one, right? And that's why I would like to discuss with you a little bit about chess books, especially chess books in the past and chess books nowadays. What are the key differences and what are the benefits, pros and cons about this stuff? Okay, uh, well, you can look at it from two levels. I mean... Mm -hmm. Obviously, one of the big differences between past books and today's books are, again, the computer analysis. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at an older book that hasn't been, you know, revised in any way, you are, um, they're not computer analyzed. And so you could find errors in them and, uh, you know, which I don't mind. I mean, I think there's something to that to see Ali Ekin say, you know, I mean, he, you know, in, in the parts that he hasn't been checked, um, you know, see what this great player, even though he was wrong about a lot, like anyone would be, mm -hmm. um, you know, because it's not computer checked. Yeah. Uh, some of the earlier books, the re more recent ones, they can do it. Um, you know, I can get insight into his mind and I might even learn from, uh, you know, what he missed or, or it might even be a challenge. Because now the nice thing also is that when I look at an Ali Ekin book, if he recommends a certain move that strikes me as wrong, in the olden days, I just have to say, well, listen, who am I to challenge Ali Ekin? You know, mm -hmm. he's probably right. 
But nowadays, I just click on the computer and, you know, if he's right, I'll learn it. But also, very often, I'll learn he is wrong, you know. So, um, so there's that, you, you know, definitely um, that's a big difference. But uh, again, the electronic books. Uh, now, I did a survey in our chess book collectors group and like 95 percent or whatever it is like a high percentage do not like electronic books. Mm hmm. I love them. Um, you know, I have a ton of books. Uh, you know, I don't know how many I have somewhere, probably close to 1,500, 2,000. I mean, I really should catalog them. May, but, I, you may know, I ask I would... one question, just interrupt for a while? What's that? May I ask one question and interrupt for a while? Sure. Is that, because you just mentioned this, is the number of books re uh, proportional to the rating or not quite? <laughs> Uh -huh. Inversely, well, it's inversely proportional. <laughs> I'd be really, really strong if I didn't have it. Well, I always said if I gain one rating point for, yeah, book, for I, every book I either I read or either bought, books. right? I'll be the yeah, world I'd, master, I'd, grand master. <laughs> I'd be challenging Stockfish, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yeah, um, but but the electronic books, I love them. So now I, I very rarely buy paper books anymore. I think. Probably the number of paper books I've bought in the last five years could be counted on one hand. Mm -hmm. It's just always electronic. And if, if I can't get an electronic format, I generally don't get it. Either Thor Chess or Kindle. Mm -hmm. um, because I just find them so much more convenient. You know, I just have them, you know, wherever I am. They lie flat if I go for the games that I'm bored. If I'm using a computer, you know, they're easy to, uh, you know, forward chess. They have the computer thing right on it. Mm -hmm. The Kindle thing, um, using Chess Vision, you can often you know, convert it. Replay so all of the stuff, right? You can. Yeah, Chess Visions, this app, uh, you can you can get the Kindle and, and it'll read the board and then you can look it on the computer if you need to. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I just, I just love, and they have it all in one place, you know. Yeah. And, and by the way, I don't just read chess books. I also try to read, I try to read a half an hour of nonfiction and a half an hour of fiction every day if, if I have time, which isn't always the case. Of non chess, this is non chess. So mm -hmm. I'm just a reader. Yeah. And, uh, and again, uh, with the electronic, a lot of people I know who tell me, oh, you know, I I need a paper book and I like the smell of a paper book. Mm -hmm. There are people who don't read that much because, you know, the fact that I could just grab my Kindle and, you know, I have like a thousand books on it or whatever it is and just immediately go to where I last was. And, you know, it, it's just, it makes it so much more convenient to read. Whereas, you know, if I'm doing paper books, you know, and, so uh, one thing on the Kindle, as I said, you know, I'm reading two different books at once just for the non-chess books. And then, mm -hmm. you know, I'm reading some chess books on the Kindle. Yeah. So if I wanted to go around like where I'm, I like to read when I'm eating, like at a restaurant or something, mm -hmm. or you know, wherever I get a chance to read, um, I'd have to be these, bring all these paper books with me. Yeah. You know, like three yeah. more paper books. I can't do that. So with the Kindle and, you know, it could be, it's on my iPhone. They have the Kindle app, um, forward chess also, I should mention. Um, so it's uh it's just so much more convenient and uh i don't know i don't miss the paper but i'm an anomaly in our group because i know whenever i've done surveys or stuff they've really they really like the paper books so. mm -hmm. and probably with the paper books there is some kind of magic if i can say that because i am in one of the groups in a polish uh, let's say uh, facebook community but not related to chess but overall the books and there are probably 90 percent of people probably even more that loves paper books no matter if uh, there is the electronic edition of the same book but they love the smell of the book the paper the fracture all of the stuff that is related to the physical object right yeah, I mean, more power to. I don't, I don't get a, someone who reads books all the time, as I said, and has thousands of books. I don't dislike paper books, mm -hmm. but I, I actually, I think at this point, I prefer the like, like if I can have a book in electronic format or paper. The only thing with the electronic format that you do have to worry about, I know, um, they there used to be this app E Plus Chess, mm -hmm. which I, I bought some books on, like Selman's Endgame book and some other thing, and they went out of business, and I lost all the books. Mm -hmm. So one nice thing about the paper books is you know you got it. Like I mean. I assume Amazon's not going out of business anytime and or forward chess. Mm -hmm. I do think um, forward chess downloads the books to your app or something. But anyway, yeah, I mean, that is the worry because it's electronic. You do worry. Do you really have the book? You know, what, what if something happens? Mm -hmm. But I mean, other than that, I like electronic books a lot more. Yeah, got it. And now let's get into the stuff because we were just mentioning about the learning of the kids, learning at the Scholastic, learning at the chess, uh, at the chess club. And now let's go into the, let's say, stuff related to the books because you just mentioned that it is possible to get pretty far without the coach, without the books partially. But now let's get into the stuff if you just get into the argument how to squeeze out all of the stuff with chess books. So I'm like, chess books okay. and the progress and the improvement, how these topics are related to each other and what are the ideas that you can give us with your experience 
Okay, so yeah, I mean, a lot's made, you know, as I mentioned Nakamura and stuff, mm-hmm. of how you, how you can get good without reading chess books, but some people take that to mean chess books can't be helpful or they're not good. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's certainly not the case. You can learn a lot from chess books, and I think, um, you know, I mean, if I had to guess, I'd imagine, you know, a large percentage of the really strong players do read chess books, you mm-hmm. know, and maybe not as, maybe they don't buy as much as we do, but yeah. they, you know, as I said, a lot of the strong players I know, they'll buy a chess book and they won't buy an art, like they're only buying it to improve. So they'll just go for that chess book and, you know, the whole way. And then afterwards, maybe they'll buy another book. But, um, you know, I mean, again, as I said, it's sort of like having a coach. Um, it's now it's not individual to your needs. But the author is generally a pretty strong or at least experienced chess player who's giving you advice. Um, so, for example, you could do the puzzles online at, mm-hmm. say, LHS or these servers. Yeah. Now, the way these puzzles are created is the computer goes through the games and they find, you know, places where someone blundered and then they create a puzzle out of it. Mm-hmm. And they're good. And, and the nice thing about the puzzles online, they get stronger and weaker based on how you, you do against them, which is very helpful. Mm-hmm. And and also, I like the themes. Like, you can choose themes uh, of puzzles, like yeah. based on old games or something. So there's definitely, I wouldn't say to anyone, don't do online puzzles. You know, mm-hmm. that's everything. It's not an either or. You can do this online stuff, and you can also do the chess books, which I think is the best. Yeah. The books, on the other hand, if I get a puzzle book, um, it's normally by an author who purposely selected puzzles that he thinks are mm-hmm. very interesting. So it's not some you random computer yeah. saying, oh, Thomas, you know, missed this fork. Can you find it? Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's something, and especially as you go more and more advanced into a guard and people like that, mm-hmm. you know, it's, uh, you know, they're very good coaches and they're coming up with puzzles. Um, so, you know, I mean, a computer's not going to simulate that. They're not going to find that, that, that type of instructive set of puzzles. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's that that you get from it. Um, that's just for the puzzle books, which, by the way, are probably the least you know, necessary for chess book because, mm-hmm. you know, then you have other things. Um, opening books, I don't know how useful opening books are. I, I've never really liked opening books anyway, even, you know, that's the one part of chess book collecting I've never gotten into because mm-hmm. they're outdated right away. But you do get, you know, them explaining stuff. I think the best type of chess book is the one um, where a top player explains his own games. Game like collections, you mean, probably, right? What's that? Game collections, right? Yeah, game collections, uh, mm-hmm. but... I think the where you really where chess books shine the most mm-hmm. is the top player, Mikhail Tal's Life and Games, uh, Bobby Fish's My Sixty Memorable Games. You know, we can go on and on. Those books are the best because now you really get a top. If they're done well, mm-hmm. and I think Tal and Fisher, the two books I mentioned, they're very honest. Like it really is them. I mean, Fisher didn't write the introductions, this or that, and Tal worked with Damsky, but for the most part, the annotations and stuff are them. And um, those are great and and you can't simulate that on a computer you know i mean if i said to someone hey listen you can sit next to bobby fisher and i'll go over his the games the 60 most memorable games that he's played mm-hmm. you know anyone wants to improve a chess and says no i don't want to do that i want to you know look at games on my computer they're not going to go very far you know that, you know so so i think that's um you know that's the main thing when when a strong player is explaining his philosophy or you know his own games mm-hmm. You know, you're just not going to beat that, and and you are going to learn a lot, and and particularly today, it's combined with the computer. So now, yeah. you know, when you're looking at the book on forward chess or, or or book in chess space or whatever it is, you can have the computer in the background also, you know, so you can investigate things that you don't understand. Mm-hmm. It might not even be finding a correction for the person. Sometimes they might not mention a move, and then you're like, well, what if he did this? And now you have the computer. Mm-hmm. I mean, the worst case scenario, if you don't have a forward chess and you know, you can't get it off. Of you could always just create the position on on um, Stockfish. You know, edit the board mm-hmm. and look at the position. So, so there's ways to use the computers with the books. And again, I don't think it's essential that you have books to get good, but I think it's probably very helpful. You, you know, if you're not doing it, you're missing a resource. And I think you can improve a lot from it, and and in a fun manner because you're really getting to meet, you know, whoever the author is. Um, you're sort of getting to meet this top player and seeing what his thoughts are and. Mm-hmm. Um, on whatever the topic of the book is. So I, I obviously, I'm not Mr. Objective, but I think they're great. And I think anyone who's not doing it, whether or not it's essential for their improvement, I think A, it might be essential for their improvement. I, I don't think that should be dismissed for certain people. Mm-hmm. The right book might make a huge difference. Yeah. Whatever it's, you know, so even though it, it, it isn't necessarily 
it isn't necessary. You know, people can be, get very good without reading chess books. It doesn't mean it's the best way to go, and it doesn't mean they can't get very good even more so by reading chess books. Mm -hmm. And also, I think they're missing out on the fun. You know, I think it's just enjoyable. You know, yeah. to go for Tal's Tal's games and you know hear him talk about the hippopotamus and you know mm -hmm. what he thought of all those anecdotes. Yeah, yeah. What, what he thought of his opponents or things like that. You know, you're 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 hearing this great player. You know, share his experience in chess, and also it's taking you back to his time. You know, the 1960s, mm -hmm. 70s when he wrote that book. Um, you know, you're seeing what chess was like back then. It's just it's a it's a lot of fun. So so if someone just wants to just sit there with a cold computer and you know just go over their blitz games with it and 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 look at the what the latest opening is according to the database. I mean, I guess you can get very far just doing that, but uh, you're missing out, in my opinion, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. And one question that comes to mind, especially about chess books, because it is many times asked uh, about my community, is related to the books at a specific level. For example, how to recognize if you are, let's say, 1200, 1400, 1600, 1800, oh. it doesn't matter, but how to recognize which book is suited for us. So like the, the best out of book that we can squeeze out, that we just buy this book, not the other. What are the, let's say, system, maybe rating system, maybe the system of, let's say, publishers that are just assigning for the specific books that we can be sure, or pretty much, uh, let's say, close to be sure, that this book help us the most, if this is possible. Okay, yeah, that, that's a good question. So, I mean, I think, again, you know, I said to improve, you're serious about improvement, you know, it's about challenging yourself. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it shouldn't be overly challenging where you're just like confusing yourself. So, um, you know, as I said, this Grigod study that I was doing this morning, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's a really tough study. And um, you might say it's above my level. <laughs> I actually looked at the solution and I still don't complete that. You know, when you're looking at the solution to the problem, you still don't understand it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're like, okay, this might be. On the other hand, you know, you could argue I'm going to get a lot from it. You know, they go back. I think I will go back and try to really work for the solution. And nowadays, you you know, if needed, you know, if you try and I think once you try it on your own, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay to look at the computer. You know, again, if you really want to improve, you should try to do it as much on your own as possible. But then after that, you can look at the computer. So at a certain point, I'll, I'll glance at the computer, what it says about my life. So if I push myself, I could get a lot from it. So even though you might at first say this book, this, this study, at least, I don't think the book is, but you might say the study is too challenging for me. Um, at first, maybe it is, but on the other hand, if I really persevere with it, I might learn a lot from it. So it's not. And I think that's the case in general in most chess books. Um, you know, it depends how much the guy was a person. Now, if the book is so hard mm -hmm. that you're just not enjoying it, like you, you just don't want to study it. You're like, oh, you know, I got to go for a half an hour of Remish's book or something, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're like, you know, then, then you know, it should, enjoyment should be a factor, you know, yeah, in improvement. Yeah, absolutely. Whatever. Whether you're just a, a little kid, you know, trying out chess or whether you're a professional chess player, you know, if you're not enjoying chess, you know, I, I don't get it. Even Magnus Carlsen has made that comment that he's going to retire when chess is no longer fun for him. So, I mean, you know, if, if the book's so hard that you really just don't want to go for it, it's like a chore, mm -hmm. then it's probably too hard for you. Um, and, you know, again, if, if every little thing, every step of the way, you're, you're feeling kind of confused and stuff um, and it's not making sense. You know, it might just be that it's a bad book, but it also could just be that you're just not ready for it. But on the other hand, you know, it, it, the book is like very easy. Now, I, I do trust for entertainment. So, you know, a lot of books I read, I really am not, you know, they're for a lower level and I'm not getting a lot from them, but I still enjoy it. You know, I, I read a lot of Kindle books where written by people who are even weaker than myself mm -hmm. and they're fun books. You know, I enjoy them. And of course, as a chess teacher, they also might be useful because I could use it to teach the, my students. Mm -hmm. But um, but still, uh, you, you know, I, I, they're fun and I enjoy them. Um, so it depends what you're getting. But if it's improvement, you want a book that's going to not be too easy, where you where you are a bit challenged with the puzzles or, mm -hmm. or positions or games you're learning from. You're, you're seeing new ideas. You're learning creative ways of thinking about chess. Yeah. Um, but, but it has to still be some element of fun. And also you have to decide how much time you want to spend on the book. So there's some books. You know, like Agard came out with this Endgame book, mm -hmm. um, you know, fantastic Endgame book. 
But, you know, if I really want to go for that book... By the way, you know, just a, a little bit of uh, explanation, because you probably know, because you are the, let's say, boss of chess book collectors, but our audience may not know it. This is the book that we are talking about, uh, this book with Jakob, Jakob Ogard, the, let's say, okay? author of the book, because he was the guest of our community three times. And at the same time, well, I was asking him about this book. And he said that this is not just a book. This is the six books in one. Right? Because exactly. the, technically, there are the parts that you can put the books, let's say, 150 pages, and it will be some like the six books in one volume. Therefore, a little bit of update, if I can say that. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, if I decide to read that, but I did buy the book, mm -hmm. but I have to confess I haven't really read it much. Um, but if I if I wanted to make, I'm sure I would improve a lot from it, and I'd probably enjoy it. He's a good writer, and it would definitely be challenging. Uh, yeah, you know, they are challenging. But, um, mm -hmm. But that would be something, I don't know, it might take me a year to read it, you know, maybe longer. I don't, you know, if I'm going through it the right way, mm -hmm. you know, so, so, you know, now you could argue, maybe, you, you know, I have to decide as a reader, do I want to spend that much time on this book? Mm -hmm. You know, I might have to do a book that's a little bit easier um, and, you know, I'll be able to get through it quicker and, and do another book. So, you know, and you could also have one book, you, you, you could like have one challenging book you read. Well, you know, so you might, let's say I took on the Agard project. It doesn't mean that I don't have to read other books. I might say, I'll read a little bit of this every week and that'll, you know, be my challenge. But then I'll also read these easier books, you know. You as a reader can decide. But so when we say level, it's really more about how much the book's going to challenge you, how much you want it to challenge you, mm -hmm. how much you'll look forward to doing it, and how much time you want to put into reading it. You know, because I do think you could have someone who's like, Say you, you know, it might, a book might be meant for people above, say, 2,000, mm -hmm. but you might have someone 1,500 who really enjoys the book, and even he does completely understand everything, he's trying hard and he's learning from it. So who's to say that that book's for people over 2,000 and the 1,500? And by the way, as we said earlier, ratings, especially nowadays, aren't always accurate anyway. So. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Maybe that fifteen hundred is actually a lot stronger than his rating. He probably thinks he's strong. Everyone seems to think they're stronger than his rating. So he might he might just not play enough tournaments or this or that. And uh, so who's you know it's it's wrong to just go by rating. But um, yeah, I think it's the factors that I just mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. And in the meantime, uh, if you are talking about the ratings, in a moment we'll be getting into the ratings. Are the ratings good or bad? Some like going a little bit of controversial topic, but very important as, at the same time. Uh, about the rating is uh, one of the stuff that is pretty much needed to address, that sometimes the players are having the global rating, if I can say that, but this rating must be distributed into the parts. For example, the simplest explanation. The player can be, let's say, 2,000 overall, so like the uh, uh, online rating, but he can become, uh, he can be 2,400 at openings, 2,000 at middle game, and 1,700 yep. at the end game, right? And then, depending yep. what kind of book he's going to read, or at least to pretend yeah. to read, he can get the book, let's say, 2,000 at the uh, uh, at the end game, 2,400 at the middle game, and 2,600 at the opening, right? Some kind of challenging, but at the same time, not that much challenge, it'll be too difficult to digest. Yeah, it's so true. You know, that's uh, another uh, not a problem with ratings. People assume, again, the funny is the dichotomy, dichotomy between how people see themselves mm -hmm. and how they see other people. So I told you that story when we first started, that it was probably already 2000 strength, but everyone thought this other guy who I beat all the time is high rated because I was only rated 1800 times he's 2000. And it is the same thing what you just said. They assume, oh, if that guy is 2000, the 2200 is like better than him in a tactics. But mm -hmm. it might be that that 2000 player is really good at tactics and he just is very bad at the opening and end games. And the 2200 player at tactics might be his weak spot, but he's good in opening and end game, you, you know? So, but people realize that about themselves. They'll be like, oh yeah, I'm really good at tactics, but I'm not good in the opening. And they have no problem realizing that they're a person with different strengths and weaknesses. They also don't realize that they might go down. Uh, they realize for themselves that they might sometimes play a game way below their strength mm -hmm. and play a game way above their strength. But when they're looking at other people, it's that number. You're you're this number. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, people just don't get it. It, it is kind of funny. Mm -hmm. and but, but what you said is a big factor. People don't realize you know, everyone's all sorts of different levels of different things. No one's exactly 2,000 in every area. I mean, mm -hmm. some people, 
Yeah, yeah, and let's get into the, uh, let's say, one of the uh, last, close to last topics, because in a moment we'll be, let's say, trying to get into the last part. Uh, rating system, because this is the one of the biggest uh, myths, one of the biggest uh, stuff that uh, new players, especially the players that are not that much like dinosaurs, uh, like us in the chess community, they are pretty much confused, because they are too much either focused about the ratings, and they do not understand the idea behind the ratings, right? If you can explain... Yeah a little bit about why the ratings systems are necessary maybe it is an evil or at the same time if we can get a little bit of insight about the uh, various systems and why the ratings may be some kind of confusing right okay um so that's a big topic for me because right now i think chess faces two major problems Mm -hmm. One is computer cheating yeah. and that's a whole other issue we all know about that and that gets plenty of attention Two is that ratings discourage people from playing. Mm -hmm. Not everyone, but a large percentage. And I want to get into why that is. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of reasons. Because right now the rating system is as inaccurate as it's ever been. Okay. And for a number of reasons. So, so let's talk about that. So first off, it particularly affects the high seed. Mm -hmm. So remember I was talking about, you might have someone who's 2400 and he doesn't go on to become grandmaster because it's just too hard and stuff. So in general, even when the ratings are working properly, your your top player, your high seed, you know, he doesn't want to play in a tournament that everyone say 400 points lower rated than him, yeah. right? Because what's going to happen is he's going to gain almost no points for winning, mm -hmm. and he's going to lose a ton if he loses. And this is the thing about chess: even if you're 400 points higher rated and so on, particularly nowadays, if you're not paying attention and you overlook a check or something. Mm -hmm. That's it. And now the rating system is going to kill you. And people, of course, it's popular to say, well, who cares about rating and don't worry about it and focus on enjoyment. But people do care about rating, especially you might be a chess teacher. You might, you know, if you're 2400, probably all your friends know you as a great player, 2400. Player. And now all of a sudden, in, in it, because of one move, you've just dropped a bucket load of points. And God forbid, and also it could happen in more than one game, you, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. Is there a 2400 you're a good player but maybe you're playing in this tournament after you've been working a long time maybe mm -hmm. you took a couple of months sometimes off sometimes health right? problems nervous system problems right Some kind yeah, of stuff. That, let alone that yeah mm -hmm. so if you're this this player and it, by the way it doesn't have to be 2400 playing in 2000 it could be 2000 playing in a tournament of mostly 1500 or 1500 playing in a tournament of mostly 1000 mm -hmm. whatever it is if you're in the high seed even when the rating system's working well you're discouraged from playing um, in a lot of events, right? You, you have to you have to decide basically. I'm going to enjoy it, mm -hmm. and I don't care about the rating. And there are some people who do that, and unfortunately for them, the people who do do that generally lose a lot of rating points. And the people like me who aren't playing, like like I, I know all sorts of people right now who who play who you know I'm I'm becoming close to in strength, you know, quote unquote, in rating, sometimes mm -hmm. even high rated. Well, oh, there's a friend of mine. So I was doing a chess class with a friend. Mm -hmm. um, he might have been watching this. And it'd be funny. He was an up and coming, like 20 year old, right? And I wasn't playing. You know, I, I wasn't playing that much. Uh, you know, I was, uh, my USF's like 21 something, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't even know what my rating was, right? Okay. Right? And he was, uh, he was like a young kid, like 20, and he, he had just broken 2000, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but he was moving up. He was working hard yeah, in yeah, chess. Yeah. Uh, you know, anyway, he'd come in one week because we were teaching the chess class together and um, he'd come in one week and uh, he, well, actually, he was right around my rating. He was a little mm -hmm. bit below it. right? And all of a sudden you go, oh, I won my game yesterday. You know, I'm higher rated than you. Right. Yeah. And now I did nothing. Like, I didn't play chess. Right? I didn't play the <laughs> They're like, OK, you know, congratulations. And then like the next week he'd come in and he'd be all depressed. Yeah, you're higher rated now. I lost this game. And I'd be like, you know, I'd be like, my screen hasn't changed at yeah, all. Yeah, you didn't he's do anything. Like he was uh, yeah. changing directions, like, oh, right? I'm playing. <laughs> you know, I'm playing. You're playing. So, so these people who, you know, if they if they make the commitment, I enjoy chess and this and that. I don't care if I'm the high seed. You know, unfortunately for them, more often than not, they're losing rating points. And people like me who are just sitting home, not even playing over the board tournaments are quote unquote getting them. Now, of course, that doesn't really matter, you know, but for some people it does, right? Mm -hmm. um, so so there's that. So that's when the rating system works perfectly. Now let's think what's going on right now. There's been a lot of a lot of things that now make it where the rating system isn't working perfectly. Mm -hmm. So for one thing, uh, there's a whole bunch of factors. Um, so for one thing, it's what I talked about before. You have these scholastic events where scholastic kids are playing against each other. So they're all improving together. A lot of them are coached and they're yeah. playing online. 
and all this stuff. So they're improving in these scholastic events, playing against each other, but it's not showing in their rating because they're all improving, mm -hmm. right? So they're not showing as much. Yeah. And then when they go to the adult system and play mm -hmm. someone like me or you, you know, all of a sudden you, because when, when you play in a tournament, there's an expected result based mm -hmm. on your rating. So, you know, whatever your rating is, you're kind of competing against your expected result rather mm -hmm. than the other people. So if you're playing someone much lower rated, even though he's really, he might be a kid who's really underrated, you're expected to beat him. And yeah. he might actually be your strength or stronger, yeah. you know, based on how he, how he plays in these computers and, and how much study he's been doing and all this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, now you're, you're, now you're already, as I said, I already said under the best conditions, the high seat's at a disadvantage. Now you're at a double disadvantage. And mm -hmm. there's tons of that, you know, there's tons of these kids right now. Yeah. And just kids, some of them might be adults who are playing online and doing all the other things that they have to do, mm -hmm. just like the kids. So ratings, uh, it used to be in the pre-computer era, if you played someone, you know, uh, they'd be more or less their rating. Yeah. You know, even here in the ICC and fixed days, people are mostly around their rating. But now the videos, the um, chess tools that you can get online and books, everything we've been talking chess about. Chess courses, streamers, YouTubers, right? All of the community yeah, system. All the stuff we've been talking about. And it's great. You know, mm -hmm. people are improving and, you know, that's, that's great. And they love chess and they want to play. But it makes it, again, really hard on the high seat. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So now the high seed, do I want to play? You know, I'm going to, uh, not only is it tough in general, but I'm probably going to be playing all these under each kids. Now you have another problem also. There used to be, there were two ratings, your national rating, mm -hmm. and your, my friend Tim Morali pointed this out, yeah. your national rating and the FIDE rating, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's it. So basically, if you were an over-the-board player, you're playing in one or the other, and they were all pretty much at slow time controls, right? Yeah. But now, FIDE has three different ratings, Blitz Rapid, you know, classical. Mm -hmm. And my country, USCF, has at least three. I think we have more. Um, but definitely, you know, we have Blitz, Quick, I think, um, you know, and obviously slow. I think the USCF has some other ones. They're constantly adding. I don't know. But it's no longer just one USCF rating, right? Yeah, There's a whole yeah. bunch. So now what might happen is I might play in a lot of USCF quick events, mm -hmm. improve my rating and, and improve my experience and, you know, learn from the quick events. But my classical, which I haven't been playing, the slow chess, is not improving at all because mm -hmm. I'm not playing in those events, right? Yeah. Now I might one day decide, hey, you know, I'm tired of quick events. I'm going to go now play the classical. Again, the people who play against me, especially if they're much higher rated, they're in trouble because I'm going to be stronger than my rating. I've, I've played, I've learned, you know, and, and my rating's not reflecting it in classical. Mm -hmm. We have all these different rating systems uh, at FIDE and national level, and that's also contributing to tremendous inaccuracy. Mm -hmm. um, now, the other thing that FIDE's done, when I obtained my FIDE rating, you, I had to have a tournament performance above 2200. Right, it, mm -hmm. you didn't you play in a FIDE tournament, but if, if, there were a certain number of unrated play, players who could play. But if you weren't 2200, like if, if your performance rating wasn't 2200, you didn't have get, get a rating. Mm -hmm. Then later on, um, FIDE lowered it to 2000. Yeah, like lowered down to five actually. Mm -hmm. Then they lowered it to 1600, and now they've lowered it to 1000. So, in my day, if I was playing these underrated kids or whatever it was, um, and by the way, again, they don't have to be kids. Um, you know, they just, if they weren't good enough, they might still be pretty good, but if they weren't good enough, they're not going to get a rating. So mm -hmm. it's not going to uh, affect me too much. Yeah. But nowadays, you know, again, and we see this all the time in the U.S. I don't know how it is in your country. You'll have someone who's the, the national rating, the USCF rating, mm -hmm. which is like 2,300, and his FIDE rating is 1,400. Very close. In my you, country, it's you, very you, close. There was a big disproportion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, huge, yeah. huge difference. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of times, again, these juniors, and they play in a tournament, and it'll be really funny because you can play a game against them. Let's say you draw, and your national rating will go up a lot, and your video yeah. will go down wrong. <laughs> so clearly, the rating system's not working, mm -hmm. right? Um, so you have that problem. Um, you, you know that they they've lowered the floor too much. They need to, you know, at least FIDE has to get back to the higher floor because mm -hmm. that's what messes things up. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it, so so all around that, uh, there's even some other things that I was thinking of. It's just on and on. But the bottom line is. It's not logical unless you just really, really don't care about your rating. Mm -hmm. you, um, you, you know, which a lot of people might say is the case, but I think it's it's a small percentage, right? Because mm -hmm. you should work hard for your rating. You know, and everyone in chess, good or, you know, whether it's right or not, everyone in chess is judging people based on their rating. Oh, that guy's really good. He's, yeah. you know, oh, why are you only this rating? You know, 
Uh, and so, uh, by the way, normally the people who are most harsh about ratings are the people who don't play that much or, or are the weaker players. Yeah, I've but especially that. weaker players who think yeah. that they are way stronger, but they say, no, no, my rating is the low because I'm not playing serious, right? <laughs> yeah, I, ha I know a story. Someone came up to um, this player. He was a, a, a fairly, you know, you know, he played a lot of tournaments. Mm -hmm. And this guy, he was 1900, right? Yeah. You know, so... He's played a lot of tournaments. He was 1900. Let's say he was 25 at the time, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but he was playing since he was a kid. Yeah. And some guy who had played him a little bit when they were kids, but now hadn't played him for years, comes up and he's like, how could you play so long and you're only 1900, right? Yeah. So yeah. this guy who said that, he started to play and he didn't do anywhere near or close to 1900. And then he just quit chess again. Yeah. So this is the other thing. This is the other thing with the rating system. What the rating system doesn't reflect even when it's working right, mm -hmm. it's the people who quit chess. So, so when I go to a tournament, you know, and and you know, I'm rated uh, 2100 UCF or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm supposed to be in like the top three percent of tournament players, right? So, so of all the people in this tournament, I should be the top three, right? That's what the uh, rating system is supposed to be. I think I think it's three, mm -hmm. but I, that's not the case. When I go to a tournament, you know, as a 2100, there's a million people stronger than me and and this and that, you know, it, it's not that big a deal. Um, and, I, and I always wonder why is that the case? And it's the case, you know, obviously for all the rating groups, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I always wonder why is that the case? And then I realized the reason is, even if you get 2100, even if you're 1500, whatever it is, there's a whole bunch of people who never got to your rating and just quit chess. They tried yeah. it out, they saw how hard it was, and they just quit. So if we really wanted to see that representation, when I go to the tournament, all the people who quit chess would have to be there too mm -hmm. before getting anywhere near, you know, 15, 1700, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, so that's not ref reflected in the ratings either. Um, all right. So, so we have a problem because we want people to play chess. If someone likes chess and they want to go to a tournament, they should be able to go to a tournament without worrying about all these things. And, and they shouldn't be penalized for having a high rating, you know, mm -hmm. or, or a high, when I say a high rating, by the way, again, it doesn't have to be a high rating, just higher than, than the people playing in the tournament. So mm -hmm. if you're 1500, you don't want to play in a tournament with all 1000s for all the reasons I just said, mm -hmm. right? So now there's if two. I can, if I can interrupt for a while, because it yeah. is a very interesting idea that you just mentioned, but I am super curious is there something like a fix or some like the idea that you may uh, share with us how it can be improved, how it can be fixed, how it can be, yeah, that's, let's that's say, corrected, right? Thing. Because this is very important. Because if we just yeah. refrain from playing, some like, no, I don't want to play because this guy is this rating, or maybe I'll avoid mm -hmm. the tournament, I'll avoid playing at all. Because just one anecdote, very briefly, to give you a little bit of, let's say, rest. There was the anecdote probably provided by Dan Heisman, right? National Master Dan Heisman, that he mentioned that he had the friend that uh, he just reached the specific uh, rating, let's say 1900, and he could just forever. I mean, playing over the board right. because he was that much scared to drop below 1900 that he said that he will never play chess again. I mean, over the board with the ratings. So like, it's something like wrong, right? Yeah, there's a lot of people like that. Now, mm -hmm. in that case, a little bit different because I'm, I mean, that's that's uh, a different thing than exactly what I'm saying, but it does show how the rating could discourage, you know, your play. But here it has nothing to do with the, in Dan's example, it has nothing to do with um the rating system maybe being a little bit inaccurate and unfair right now. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just some guy who was worried about dropping below 1900, yeah. which does discourage people also. I'm not, uh, so, okay, I have two fixers for it. Mm -hmm. One is my idea, which I'm going to be the first one to admit will never happen. Because oh. it's, it's way beyond, like, it's just too drastic of a change. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't, you know. And then the second one is some of the realistic options that, that have been proposed. Okay. Okay, so my idea is what's a norm-based system. So you know how you have IM norms and GM norms mm -hmm. and stuff? This is the way my idea would work. Yeah. There would no longer be like 1832 or 1892, these little numbers in between the 18, you know, and 1900, right? Or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a, there's an A player who's, let's say, 1800 to 2000. There's an expert, 2000 to 2200. There is, um, you know, we, we just keep sectioning it off like that, yeah, whatever yeah. the class are. So if I'm an expert, if I'm an expert rating category for, Purposes of calculation, mm -hmm. I'm 2000, period. Okay. 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 And and so on and so forth. When you get to the Grandmaster level, there would be 2500 level Grandmaster, 2600 level Grandmaster, this and that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's that's the first thing. Okay. Um, and that's necessary because, um, all right, so let me just get more to it. 
Okay, so now if I'm so let's say I'm expert level, so mm -hmm. I'm at two thousand, right? Yeah. If I want to improve, I have to have three tournament performances above my rating. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you could get into if I had a twenty five hundred performance rating, I'd gain more than if I had a twenty three hundred performance rating or, or whatever it is. But um, you, you know that's for the statisticians. But at the very least, if I perform above my performance level. Mm -hmm. In three tournaments, and yeah. again, you could argue whether it should be three or four or yeah, whatever it is. Yeah, we can just set Several it up. details, mm -hmm. yeah. but let's say three we set it at, mm -hmm. right? Now I move up to the next category, Master, you know, 2000. So now my rating would be 2200. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I perform below my rating for three tournaments, yeah. now I drop down to A player, right? Wow. 2000. Mm -hmm. So now, and now I can also erase below tournament performances with higher. So, so if, I, if I once perform below my 2000 rating uh, class, right? Mm -hmm. Then if my next turn, I perform above it. I can't, they cancel each other out, yeah. right? Now let's see why this is different than today's rating. So I go, I decide I want to enter a tournament. I'm, let's say the high seed mm -hmm. and, but I'm kind of tired. I was working all day. I haven't yeah. done much time recently, right? Mm -hmm. For me to drop my level, I'm going to, it's not going to be like I, I play some game and you know, I, okay, let's say right now I play a game, right? Mm -hmm. Against someone much lower rated. And it's the example I gave before, you know, I, I'm not paying attention on some move. I yeah. overlook a chat and he wins the game. So now I'm going to drop, I think my USF right now is 2112. You know, I'm going to drop a lot of points from that if, if he's much lower rated than me, right? Mm -hmm. Which I might have spent a lot of time building up, right? To get yeah. those points, yeah. right? So now, I don't know, let's say after that I'm 2000. 98 or you know i, I don't know mm -hmm. what below 2100 got it mm -hmm. yeah or it might even be below 100 right yeah yeah you know i can't afford too many of those things if i'm the high feet right mm -hmm. so i'm gonna say gee you know i'm really tired and you know and then i'm gonna be like why did i enter this tournament i knew i was tired you know it's gonna be a whole big thing now if it's the norm based system that i just mentioned to you mm -hmm. it's not that big a deal i'm gonna have to do this a lot you, you know in this turn i'm gonna have to perform below my level Overlook a bunch of these tournaments. Like one move's not going to do it, mm -hmm. you know. And then at the end of the tournament, if I don't, if I if I somehow squeak by with my rating after that, even after that check, no harm done. I'm still two thousand, and I didn't perform below my level. Mm -hmm. If I do really badly and and do perform at the eighteen hundred level, eighteen hundred two thousand level, um, then what will happen? Still nothing. I'm still not going to regret playing that tournament because it's three. Mm -hmm. And now let's say I do play in three of these tournaments, and I do perform below my level in three tournaments. Yeah. As a realistic person, I have to just say, I must be overrated, you know? Yeah. Like, there's no, it's not that I overlooked a check. It's that I've made a lot of bad tournaments and now I deserve to drop. And guess what? You know, I'll work on my chest and hopefully I'll move back up. So it's not as painful as mm -hmm. feeling that sometimes you put an underrated kid, you know, or, or this or that. It, ha it takes a lot. Yeah. And also to move up would be obviously the reverse. Most of the time what's going to happen mm -hmm. is people like us who have played, you know, let's say our rating is more or less correct. Mm -hmm. Most of the time what's going to happen is I'm going to have a fun time playing a tournament. And I'm going to perform about my level. And there's going to be no change. You know, it's going to stay where it is. And, and I'll, I'll have enjoyed the tournament. And, you know, too bad I didn't, you know, move up a level. But, you know, I, I could work on it. You know, there's every incentive to play in another tournament and try to get above it. So I think my system, uh, you know, which I call a norm-based system, would encourage playing more. Now, mm -hmm. as far as the accuracy of it, I have no idea whether it's more or less or equal in accuracy. I have contacted a number of chess statisticians, uh, the ones, well-known ones in the chess community, um, none of them really said anything bad about it, but they never got back to me about mm -hmm. how accurate it is. Honestly, from my personal point of view, I don't even care if it's less accurate. I think the main thing is people would be able to play and, and yeah. enjoy tournaments without worrying about their rating. So I think it would be a lot better. Is it going to happen? No. You know, obviously it would change everything about chess, and I don't think, you know, it's going to happen. But um, that's what I would do. Now, now, some of the more realistic proposals that, that have been mentioned by other people um well obviously i told you how we have all these different rating systems mm -hmm. um that's a bit of a problem i mean i don't know how you would handle that because uh i don't know you, you know i mean game 30 i think is very different than than like a two-hour game mm -hmm. so if you get rid of one of those time controls i don't know but at the same time that does contribute to the inaccuracy um that would be a tough fix you'd have to figure out maybe if you do well in a lot of game thirties, maybe somehow you'll you should still gain points in the slower time, you know. Like like maybe you should never be like say, you know, 
a hundred points lower rated in one time control than I mean, chances are if someone say two thousand in game thirty, they're probably pretty close to two thousand in classical, even though they haven't played playing much. So again, this is a question for statisticians, but you know, I would say somehow if you're doing well, you know, gaining points in game thirty, it should reflect uh, let's say rapid, not game thirty. If you're gaining points in rapid, it should at some point start to improve your classical and vice versa. Mm-hmm. Um so that would be one thing. The other thing that was proposed for a lot of these underrated kids that we we're talking about, mm. not just I keep saying kids, but it could be adults. Yeah, too. yeah, of course. Um, we have one guy, uh, like a 1300 player playing in our local club here who beat a master and it's simply because he hadn't played since he was a kid and he, and then he beat another strong player. So he's clearly, you know, way underrated, but mm-hmm. you know, he just play. Okay. So then the other thing uh, that people have suggested is uh, for, for these, uh, people you if you perform a certain amount above your rating Mm -hmm. then for purposes of rating calculation it's based on your performance Mm -hmm. so if you have a 1300 player who has a 2100 performance instead of the losses being rated against the 1300 it would be like the participants lost to a 2100 so you use that that's another solution that was proposed which i think sounds pretty good Uh, i think if you get rid of the floors you you do that that performance thing um some people have also suggested that you could make it where people lose less rating points than another person gains Mm -hmm. so if i play someone and i lose so it could be based on some criteria you know they're a junior or this or that but um that you know if i if i lose to him it's not going to hurt me as much and Mm -hmm. he'll still gain a bunch of points so he doesn't stay underrated so those are some of the realistic proposals I've heard. I think they should do almost all of them. You know, again, I don't have a statistics background. There might be some arguments against them for the accuracy. Mm-hmm. So I'll leave that to the statisticians. But one thing I do think, no one's really talking about this. And I think it is hurting chess uh, quite a bit. And mm-hmm. it's discouraging people. It's making people quit or, or at least at the very least not play. And, uh, and it shouldn't be. It, the, the rating system and the whole chess, everything should be arranged i don't even care if the ratings aren't accurate you know mm-hmm. i'd like them to be accurate but more important is that someone can go play in front i mean honestly if they got rid of all the ratings, william lombardi mentioned this to me yeah, william lombardi. You know, years ago he thinks chess would just be better without ratings at all you just go down you play you try to win a prize you try to beat people mm-hmm. and that's it and, and again speaking for me personally i don't think lombardi's uh idea would be you know popular among chess players but for me personally I, i'm all for it you know i'd have no problem with that um but because again i think it's less about accuracy of rating and more about encouraging people to play mm-hmm. um that's basically my thoughts okay thank you very much and i have the question from our friends from chess community because we are just pop up thank you very much guys for poko hai shahe by the way poko hai shahe in polish in polish is the translation falling off to chess this is one of our friend who just uh, make the community better and better and they just provided uh, the friends to our community and one of the friends Boruveczka, our friend Christian asked the question wouldn't that discourage older players for instance older grandmasters who currently play at a lower level from participating in rated tournaments this is the question for the for your let's say uh north based system approach Wait, wouldn't it disc- what did he say for wouldn't the that discourage older players for instance older grandmasters who currently play at a lower level from participating in rated tournaments older grandmaster from participating in rated tournament mm-hmm. in other words he's saying forget about grandmasters he's saying Someone who knows that they're overrated, it would discourage them from participating. Is that what you like? In other words, they think they're overrated. So, yes, prob- so, probably I mean, this is the case, I guess. Listen, if, if you think you're overrated and you don't want to play because of that reason, you know, I mean, that's just going to happen. What can I tell you? I mean, I don't know that we want overrated players playing, and, and you know, I mean, I don't know. If that's a personal decision for the person to make. I mean, if I knew I'm overrated. Mm-hmm. Oh, I mean, and and I and I like playing chess. Uh, you know, I'm just going to go do it. Now, it is true. You know, there there might be uh, again. You know, I mean, they're not going to lose the grandmaster title. They'll still be grandmaster. Mm-hmm. Oh, is that what it means? Maybe. I mean, I I think you know, I, I don't think they'd make the system where you can lose your grandma the grandmaster titles for life. He says maybe but, I'll just explain a little bit. He says that currently someone lose their rating. So, for instance, dropping from twenty five to twenty three hundred, but they will maintain their grandmaster title. That's what he meant. 
Yeah, why not? I mean, they made grandmasters, so they could keep their grandmaster title. Grandmasters are title for life. I mean, obviously, again, I don't even think the system's going to happen. But if it was to happen, mm-hmm. I'm going to throw in things like we're going to take away. I mean, I think someone who's made grandmaster, they deserve to keep their title. You know, whatever it is, whatever their strength now, you know, it, that was quite an achievement and shouldn't be taken away. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you could argue again. I just gave the broad outline. You could argue. That once you get to Grandmaster, there's no more cat like the next category is a world champion. You could leave it at that if you wanted to, um, which is more or less how we have it now. I mean, some people will say that's a bad thing because you have 2,500 level Grandmasters and you know like yeah. Hikaru Nakamura. Yeah, you, super you know, you masters. A, mm-hmm. a huge difference in level. But if you want to say out of respect for the Grandmaster title, you want to keep the way it is now and just have it like that. Mm-hmm. You know, again, I'm not concerned too much of the particulars with that. Um, there aren't that many grandmasters in the world, so if they don't want to play, you know, it's you know it's a very small percentage of the playing people. Mm-hmm. So they they you know, but um, but if we wanted to make it where it doesn't affect the grandmaster title, that's fine. Also, you know, the main thing I'm concerned about is the huge numbers right now that don't want to play because of all the reasons that we mentioned, and mm-hmm. and because in the end, the way the rating system is now, it is like demonstrably like this is not my opinion. Yeah. It's math. You can go on chess space. There's people who have written about it. Um, just Sonos, us, the mm-hmm. famous yes, has an article on chess space about it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you go on my FIDE World Championship 2023 group, I have a post about this, and I I put the Sonos article and a lot of our other articles on it. Um, it's just mathematically. This is my opinion. Right now, the rating system is not accurate, and it's getting more and more inaccurate. Mm-hmm. There's all sorts of underrated people who aren't, you know, all the reasons we talked about. Yeah. So, um, and that leads to people being even more discouraged than normal. Mm-hmm. So again, my system, I think, would would battle that. I don't think it's going to happen. So in that case, let's go to these other proposals that were made, and a lot of them were made by people like Jess Sonos and, and statisticians who know their, mm-hmm. who know all about this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but something has to be done. I, I mean, just sit around. I mean, you know, it's a little bit unfair. You, you know, these people they don't want to play, and they and it's logical. It's a, I mean, again, you could argue, forget about rating, just enjoy yourself and play. Mm-hmm. But let's face it, in the real world, it's logical. If someone thinks, you know, again, they're they're performing against their expected rating, and if their participants are much higher than their current rating, you, you know, than the participants' current rating, and are going to perform better, you're basically just going to lose points that you might have worked really hard for. Mm-hmm. And by the way, as a random GM who's underrated, I mean, I think for some GMs, this might be a really good thing because right now, once you get the GM title, mm-hmm. there's no like if you don't think you're going to be world champion. You don't really have many goals anymore. These are the extreme. Most GMs are very goal oriented. They wanted to get their title, yeah. and now you know now that they have their title. You know they know they're not going to be world champion. They just you know they have nowhere else to go. Now you know with the norm based system, you, they could say okay, from 2,500 grandmasters, I'm going to move up. I mean, other people might not like that. You know, but that's again, grandmaster is a lot, like 0.001%. Yeah, it's a very very small percentage. So mm-hmm. they just want to keep it the way it is now and. You become GM and that's it until world champion. I'm fine with that. I don't really care. You know that. That's just a detail. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you very much for this proposal and the interesting approach to rating because I had the experience that I wanted to share that I played at some point after some hiatus, let's say two or three years at the tournament over the board, and it was let's say ten years ago, maybe a little bit more. And I, I back then uh, was some like 1800 Elo. Right, and I was playing and facing players 1100, 1200, 1300, and I was literally scared to lose against any of these players, even if I was a very bad shape because I didn't practice chess. I was not in a chess yeah. shape, and I was I'm like, oh my goodness, my rating will drop up to 100 after one tournament, right? And if exactly. I wanted to become a candidate master, of course it was not realistic, but anyway, I wanted to become, <clears throat> let's say, 21 or 2200 Ifida. If I get, uh, let's say, down, I will never become grand ma- not grand master, candidate master, right? And therefore, yeah, yeah. The, the writing system shouldn't paralyze and shouldn't, uh, let's say, push people away from uh, playing the games, right? Exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, 100%. And you're just one of like a million stories like that. Mm-hmm. And again, it's worse now. And by the way, I didn't mention another thing that contributed to the accuracy. Yeah. Maybe it's um, temporary, but the COVID epidemic also. Yeah, you had lots yeah. Of people it's not good. Playing mm-hmm. and, and getting better and better. That could work itself out, I guess, as people keep playing. But um, I don't know. Again, I, I think it's kind of a mess. It's uh, unnecessary. And, and it's funny because no one's talking about it. They're all talking about computer cheating, which is also a problem. But mm-hmm. uh, 
And by the way, computer cheating sort of rela relates to this anyway, because you might lose to a cheater and lose a lot of points. But um, mm -hmm. whatever. I, I don't know. I mean, there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I I'm just going to mention it to anyone I know. And if other people mention it, uh, hopefully at least the realistic ideas will get um, implemented and soon. Yeah, because uh, you know, if it doesn't, you know, we're going to be losing a lot of promising uh, players. Mm -hmm. And it's pity because uh, if just uh, should uh, makes us happy, as Taras just mentioned with this quote, it should be let's say uh, having the opportunity to play without the fear of losing, right? Because chess should exactly. be a learning, a learning vehicle, right? That gives us the opportunity to grow, to reflect, to analyze, and not something. No, no, I'm not going to play because some something happens that I don't want to make it happen. But at the same time, it's some like an artificial stuff but it blocks me from reaching the higher goals, right? So I'm like a little I mean, bit of, let's say, catch-22, uh, let's say, situation. Like, I don't, I don't, I mean, of course, I don't like lose, no one likes losing. But if you told me I'm going to enter a tournament and I'm going to lose to people whose ratings were accurate and they're just going to outplay me, mm -hmm. I could accept that. You yeah. know, you, know that, that's, you lose a game, they played well. And of course, at the club level, you know, there's always going to be blunders, so I understand that it might occasionally be because of a blunder. But for the most part, you know, the real fear is, you know, some sort of freak loss. You know, you just make a dumb move at the wrong time mm -hmm. and um, you're just hammered by it. You know, those are the losses. And, and again, it might be so. And if he's an adult, he took off from work. He paid a lot of money for a hotel. He's spending his only vacation time playing this tournament. I had a tournament I played in. Um, where uh, it was a team tournament, the, the Amateur Team East, a big tournament in the US. Mm -hmm. and I was playing fourth board, even though I was like, I don't know, 2100 or something. And um, the first round, and my friend was watching this, so it wasn't just me. Mm -hmm. I played some guy, he's 1600, um, way up, you know, I'm just deciding how to win. And he was using an analog clock right and um and it's funny because i forgot my digital and i asked my friend for a digital and he was going to give it to me the next round but i'm right around time control right it's like i have to make another move for time mm -hmm. control i'm totally winning position stupidly you know I, I look at the analog clock it looks like i have enough time and um you know i i so you know i don't know let's say it looks like i have two minutes left mm -hmm. yeah yeah With the analog is very difficult mm -hmm. i spent 30 seconds on my movie you know i'm winning you know it's like there's a little something to think about so it's been maybe 30 seconds on my movie, and the guy goes flag. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? And, you know, and I don't know if he cheated. I don't think he did. I think it was just, it was a weird clock. And, you know, analog clocks are hard to read. Yeah, very, very hard But, sometimes. you know, that loss, like, really annoyed me. Um, whereas if he had outplayed me, I mean, it still would have been annoying. He's a lot of high, lower rated than me. Mm -hmm. But if he had outplayed me or played well, I'd say, what can I do? You know, he was a good player. But when you lose, like, unfairly, and then it, like, kills you. You know, you lose, like, a ton of rating. But if you're someone who doesn't play that often, it's gonna follow you for a long time until you get a chance to play it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, little things like that or overlooking a check or whatever and then harshly paying for it, you know, um, I think that keeps a lot of people from playing. Yeah, definitely. And uh, let's get into the last part of our interview. It's a fascinating one, therefore I could just g drag it for hours, but I know that you probably may not be that much willing to do so. But anyway, the last part for our interview is just a little bit about the present situation, especially World Championship match. What do you think about this match? What do you think about the, let's say, uh, viewers, about the audience, about the broadcast, about all of the commentary, about the media? How do you, let's say, experience this match? Because it is one of the matches, one with the World Championship matches, by the way, that is pretty much uh, different than the usual ones, right? What do you think yeah. about it? I mean, it's, uh, you know, obviously I can go on and on um, because I run the site, you know, the uh -huh. PA World Championship <laughs> 2023 site. You know, but uh, basically, I mean, obviously, I, I had, even though I, I always loved the World Championship, I have all the books on the World Championship matches, and it was always like a special thing for me when I got into chess. It was during the Ka Karpov Kasparov matches, which were amazing. So it always had a special place for the World Championships. But the last few matches have been really boring for me. I'm sort of like with Magnus Carlsen on there, like, like, oh man, they played all this theory and then it was just a drawn position and it's like game after game like that. So I was starting to agree with Magnus that maybe, you know, the format kind of is no longer um, realistic. But obviously what we see from this match, it was more about Magnus than it was the, the format. Like basically what would happen when Magnus played, Magnus would play very carefully because he knew basically what the example I was just giving, he knew 
if I don't mess up, you know, I'm going to beat this guy. You know, he's a lot weaker than me. Mm -hmm. So he was so afraid of, like, uh, making any sort of mistake. Particularly, you know, he's in a sense playing against Stockfish. You know, if he makes some mistake in the opening, um, like one time happened to him against a Nand or something, you know, he's going to lose to this weaker player, and then there's not many games left, and he could lose the match. And, and of course, that almost happened to him against Karjakin, who I think was only, like, number 16 or so in the world at the time, or somewhere, you know, lower... But in any case, um, so Magnus is playing ultra carefully. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you have his challenger, you know, Caruana, Karjak, and his, um, and then. So they um, they know he's the better player. And they're kind of also being very careful because, like, if I do anything wrong, he's going to crush me. He's a much better player. Um, well, I don't know if they're thinking that, but they, they at least they realize that he's a better player. So, um, so it led to these just really boring matches of just all draws and then he wins in the rapid tie break mm -hmm. um so i was on his side but now we see that it was more about magnus because now you have ding Lorin and ian Ipanichi. they both think they can beat the other you know neither one's magnus and they're just going for it and um it's little, it's so exciting i didn't think a match like this would be possible anymore i really didn't i thought it would just all be preparation and this and that what's really funny it looks like Ding didn't even prepare that much, you know. It doesn't. I guess preparation's been leaked. He's playing like this innocuous H3 stuff in the second game, mm -hmm. you, you know. So it's like he didn't even prepare that much, and he's not getting crushed by any means. I mean, maybe I don't know what'll happen after our interview. You know, Nepo has a one point lead, but at the mo for the most part, even not even preparing that well, he's been able to kind of hang in there. Um, so it's just been so exciting. As far as the um, the media stuff, um, Hikaru Nakamura brought this up, and I totally agree. Uh, I don't know why they don't have the boards. They used to have it when the player talked about the variations in the press conference. There would be a chessboard that appeared and showed the moves. Yeah. I mean, what the heck? This is like millions of dollars they spend on these matches. Yeah. You can't just do that. You don't get a board. Um, so they don't have that. That's really weird. They ask Sometimes they ask the silliest questions, like what opening you're going to play and stuff. I don't know. Mike Klein does a good job. He has some good questions. Um, I admit, it's kind of hard to come up with good questions sometimes because mm -hmm. basically you're even going to ask them about something that has nothing to do with the match, like who's your favorite player or something. That seems kind of silly. And then, or if you ask them about the match, they either can't really answer it, like it's about some opening you're going to play, or, mm -hmm. you know, like Ding's amazingly open, you know. Most, yeah, most I think players, he's amazing. I remember Magnus, uh, when he first played a Nan. He like wouldn't even say who who his seconds were. He mm -hmm. like like a man revealed his seconds. He's like I'm working with this and this and this. And then they go to Magnus. So well, who are your seconds? And Magnus is like oh, I'm not telling anyone. We can you know, say like that a, he broke the unwritten rule, right? Yeah. <laughs> that everybody just have, revealed the seconds. Yeah. And now Ding is like he's telling everything. Oh, I was really nervous. Oh, you know. So um, but anyway, yeah, it is hard to come up with a good question. Again, I think Mike Klein's done a good job. Maybe some other people. Um, but, uh, yeah, the press conferences in general have been kind of silly. Um, but the match is great, and, uh, you know, I'm really excited about it. It's, uh, you know, I hope Ding um, doesn't lose another game. You know, right now he's down by one. So mm -hmm. if he loses another game, you know, then he's really going to have a, a tough time coming back. But although, you know, the other fun thing about this is they both are capable of just falling apart. Mm -hmm. So even if Nepo had a two-point lead, you'd have to say, well... You know, look how he falls apart. He fell apart against Magnus after a loss. So as it comes closer, even if he had a two-point lead, he might choke and all of a sudden lose. So that adds to the excitement. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping it stays close. I'm, I'm sort of rooting for Ding, uh, you know, but, um, you know, uh, listen, whoever wins, it's not going to really change my life. So, you know, in the end, you know, at least they put on a good a, a good tournament. Um, I mean, a, a, an exciting match. And, and it's more than I ever would have expected before the match. Mm -hmm. And the, the question related to World Championship, which one is your most favorite? Some like from all of the chess history, which of oh, the all? World Championship of all of them is your favorite and why? And why? If you would like to Probably share. Probably the Tal Bokdanek 1960 match for two reasons. Uh -huh. uh, one, I really like Tal and I like the way he plays chess. I mean, no, no, I'm not exactly an anomaly there. I mean, it's just so great. And to beat Bokdanek, well, and not that I have anything against Bokdanek, but he's so like, he was sort of arrogant. He was, uh, you know, if you read the, I read some of the magazines at the time before the match, and everyone, you know, Bronstein on down was like, Bostonic's going to crush Tal and mm -hmm. you know, play this way and win a world championship. Like, 
all the, all the players, like everyone was against Tao beforehand. Not necessarily because they disliked him personally, but they just didn't believe his style could work. Yeah. Especially against Botfinet. Yeah, Botfinet, um, that scientific guy, right? Yeah, yeah, and he just very, you know, proper and this and that. So, you know, I mean, he had that crazy, uh, I think it was game six, where he just sacks the night out of nowhere. Um, it was just such an exciting match. And then the other thing about it is his book, of course. So mm -hmm. he has this incredible book, maybe one of the best chess books ever written. Well, it is one of the chess books ever written, um, where he really, he was a great writer. Uh, again, it kind of, you know, letting you see it from his perspective. So you really, when you read that book, you really feel like you're on Tal's team. It's as, something like, like a, you'll be sitting next to him, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, you're, and you learn a lot because he had such an instructive... You know, his style's so weird because no one can really, you know, there's very few people who can play like that, like Tao. I don't, I don't care who you are. But at the same time, you do get a better appreciation of the initiative. Like, I know the times I've gone through Tao's games. I've started, you know, unconsciously just playing more aggressively and sharper, and it just kind of rubs off. I, I certainly don't play anywhere near as well as Tao. I mean, I don't know how anyone could play like that. Um, just the, some of his games, it's just like, you know, it's either him or Stockfish playing. Like, mm -hmm. I don't see any other player in history who could play like that. It's just so, such amazing games. But, um, you know, unfortunately, he had poor health. Um, if he didn't have poor health, and, and, you know, if he grew up today, I think th there's no way of knowing for sure, but using these computers and sparring with them and analyzing with them, he, God, I mean, and, and if he had good health, like Magnus's health, forget it. You know, I, we never, I don't think we've ever seen anything that strong because. Boy, I look at his games, uh, just unbelievable. So yeah, yeah definitely the 1960 match because of the book and because of uh, Tao is my favorite, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. And the last question for today's uh, meeting is the question related to chess, but some like in a global way. How do you see chess present? I mean, chess as a global. You can say chess as the community, chess as the players, chess as the media. Overall, you can just divide it whatever you wish at present and the next five to ten years. How would you make a little bit of prediction, a little bit of estimation? It's up to you. Well, I mean, chess in the present, there's nothing to predict. It's it's chess in the present. Yeah, yeah but chess um, in the present in the sense, how do you feel that uh, chess in the present is something like uh, transforming into the past? So, like, is it a positive trend or negative trend? For example, when Chesscom just uh, took the, all of the companies into, oh. let's say, the big one, right? What are the changes? Is it a good one or bad one? You can just estimate as much as you wish. Well, um, yeah, I mean, in general, I'm against monopolies. Um, so, yeah, I'm not, I'm not super... I mean, I think, as I said in the past, I think Chess.com's done a great job. And I like Eric and Danny, you know, they, they seem like they really like chess. But, hey, you know, what's that saying about power corrupting, you know? Eventually, you, you know, it's better to have different sites competing. Uh, you know, I do believe in competition um, at that level, you know. Um, so uh, I don't think it's a good thing necessarily, but it hasn't hit. And, and you know, it's possible, you know, it, it will stay a good thing. You know, like, like right now things are good, you know, so possible it might be. But if I had my way, they'd all be separate and competing against each other. Um, of course, we still have LHS at least. Um, and as far as the future goes, um, I'm very concerned about computer cheating uh, and and just in general how you know games are becoming, you know, just um, you know it used to be again like a player like Tal, you could like admire his genius mm -hmm. and and even if we go further back, you know, the further back you go, like Morphe say, you know, it's all about their genius. You, you know, you're really like, wow, how did Morphe see that? You know, and, and you know, it's Morphe. Nowadays, it's genius combined with tremendous preparation and work. And um, I still admire the players, and I still think they're great players, stronger than Morphe, obviously. But, um, you know, it's okay. You know, they probably worked a lot on chess. I mean, some of them probably work less than others. But, um, you know, for the most part, I don't know where the preparation ends and where the, the real genius begins. And it's just going to get more and more like that. Um, you know, so, and again, the computer cheating worries me, not just in chess, but in general. I think a lot of stuff with computers is going to be, uh, is very scary. And I don't think people are, I don't think the world's preparing for it well enough. Um, obviously, the AI threats mm -hmm. are there. Um, you know, uh, deep fake videos where they can make people, you know, do anything, you know, and be totally fake. So we're entering into a world where, um, 
it's very hard to know what reality is. Like there's going to be AI and deep fake mm-hmm. videos and, you know, computer cheaters online and different stuff. And, you know, it's, it's kind of scary actually. And, and I don't think the world's prepared for it. technological unemployment, I think is underrated. You know, that's coming. You know, I don't care what people say. <laughs> you know, everyone's like, well, you know, there's going to be as many new jobs created as there are. Um, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I don't think that's happening. You know, I, I go on YouTube. I see robots dancing around doing stuff that no human could do. I see AI, you know, advancing. I mean, there will be a place for humans for a while. But for the most part, I, there's very few jobs in the next. I don't know how long it's going to be. Whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. But sooner or later, the robots and computers are just going to be better at humans at just about everything. And that could be a good thing if, if we're prepared for it. Or what, like, like a friend of mine was pointing this out to me. They were talking about predict- productivity is going to increase so much that the four day week will be um, implemented in the US. Uh, they might already have that in Europe. Mm-hmm. They, yeah, yeah. But it's, it, there's, it's not in the US, right? That mm-hmm. the four day week will be implemented. I think what's more likely to happen is productivity is going to increase so much that they're going to just fire a lot of people and keep the other ones working five days a week. Yeah. You know, that's just the way it is. Unless. <laughs> Unless something's figured out with the government or whatever, because again, I, I don't think they've been planning enough for it. Um, so yeah, I'm worried about chess and I'm worried about the real world. Uh, I, I don't know. We'll see. But again, I, I I tend to be pessimistic sometimes. So hopefully, you know, like honestly, you know, right now things are great. I, I, as I told you, I thought the World Championship was kind of a done format, and now I've been proven completely wrong. This is a really exciting match and mm-hmm. chess. You know, a lot of people when the computers came along said it was ruined. Well, now we're in a huge boom. So there's no way to know for sure, but um, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about tests in the world in 10 years, but we'll see. Hopefully I'm wrong. Yeah, we'll see how it, how it goes and we'll see how what the future brings. Thank you very the much. The good thing about being a pessimist is you're often pleasantly surprised. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what is the safest approach, if I can say that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, thank, thanks so much. Thank you very much, my friend, for uh, accepting the invitation. Thank you very much for sharing all of this stuff. Believe me, you are one of the most uh, entertaining and most informative pl- uh, person that I have ever met at the same time. I'm really grateful uh, for all I providing all of the value, all of the benefits, especially about the Chess Collector's books, because I'm not sure if you know, but without you as the person who just uh, created this book, managing the, uh, uh, the group, sorry, managing the group, I wouldn't be able to invite all of the people that are in inside our group, for example, Cyrus Lakwadala, Jakub Ogard, Andrew Terehov, and therefore you just help, let's say, creating the book, help me to provide the value to our community, our community is just bringing it together in, and we are just expanding. And that's why I'm yeah, super grateful for it. it. I love mm-hmm. it. Okay, I'll let you go. And um, by the way, so one, one more stuff, because uh, our chat is uh, going to greet you. And uh, our friend Grasshopper1959 says that uh, thank you, Brian from Grasshopper. Therefore, probably you may oh. not know him. What's his name? Grasshopper. Grasshopper1959. I don't think I know him, but thanks for thanking me. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, we are very grateful for all of the stuff and you are very, let's say, informative and you just put all, a lot of the, let's say, uh, information in the way that we can reflect it over the next weeks. Great. I mean, I, I enjoyed it and you did a great job to, to get it out of me. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm, I'm super grateful for that and uh, I'm super happy that we could do it, especially as we just squeeze out all of the topics I prepared and all of the topics we just make the negotiations. It was great. Thanks so much, Thomas. Okay, thank Bye. you very much, my friend. Have a great time. Take care. See ya. Bye-bye. Bye.